Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Welcome to Rob Observations, episode number 290. I, of course, am the vice Roman of verisimilitude, your master of fun and wonder, your existential Mr. Rogers, bringing you this, the NPR of the YouTube genre space, Rob Observations, the show about something, and I am Robert Meyer Burnett. And I welcome all of you, all of you members of this, the post-geek singularity community, you imagination connoisseurs. It's great to be back. I've been gone for a couple of days. This week has been a little, you know, my my December 2019 has been a little uh, remiss. I've been busy. Ladies and gentlemen, I can say to you for the very first time, and this is an amazing announcement, it's an amazing thing for me to say, I have worked on Tango Shalom since May of 2016. Tango Shalom is a movie that I uh, have produced, one of the producers. I am the editor of the film, and I am the post supervisor. And yesterday, I, for the very first time, sat down and watched from beginning to end the movie completed. I never thought this day would come. And let me tell you, uh, I, 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 you know what? When you guys are working, if you ever work on an independent movie, a budgetarily challenged movie that had many production issues that was was shot and reshot, not reshot, but shot, and they we did pickups and we added to things, even in the past year, I mean, it really is an iterative process, filmmaking, and when you're working at the the small budget, uh, small budget level that we were working at, it, it was a chore. And the reason it took so long to get made was for various reasons, but everybody put in 100%. And when I sat down yesterday, it was the very first time that I ever, uh, as the editor, I was always looking at it with a critical eye. I, I, I could never look at the movie and just watch it. Well, yesterday I was in a position where there was nothing I could do. I couldn't stop it and go back and change something. I was watching it on the mixing stage, and I, I just sat back and let it wash over me. And I was, I was impressed. I'm like, this movie's done. Now, is it Endgame? No. Is it Star Wars? No. Many of the people that watch this channel might not ever uh, be interested in seeing it. But I will say this. To me, it represents everything great about independent cinema and everything great about what movie making is all about. And I will always look back on it fondly. And I will say, you know what? Uh, if this is the last movie I, I ever work on in my career, I know it's not because I'm jumping right into another one, but I, I, uh, I can honestly say, well done. Everybody put in 110%, and for what it is, it is, uh, I think, delightful. And I hope you'll be able to see it sometime in 2020, and you guys will enjoy it. If you ever wanted to see an indie Jewish spiritual quest family dance comedy fable, Tango Shalom is the movie. Remember, Rabbi Moshe Yehuda is about to discover divine intervention can be rather unorthodox. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. What an ad line. I wrote that ad line. Uh, you can see the poster hopefully soon. It's up. I put it up. Anyway, that's very exciting. But you know what else is exciting? What else is exciting is that this show, as you all know, is sponsored by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. And as you all know, we are giving away a Lucky Tiger, a bottle of their uh, body wash, their head-to-tail body wash, and we're giving it away once a week until Christmas. And if you like any of their, uh, if you want to like any of their stuff, if you've never got any of their stuff, I recommend all of you run, don't walk to the Lucky Tiger website at getluckytiger.com, buy any of their lovely, wonderful products, which, by the way, I use to shave my beard off. And if you punch in PGS at getluckytiger.com when you check out, you get 20% off your order, which is pretty exciting, to be honest. I think it's pretty exciting. You know what else? You know what else is exciting? And I can't believe this is true. Tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow is December 7th, 2019. Now, no, we we I I do never I I never would would I do not want to ever um besmirch or in any other way dishonor the memory of our service men and women who lost their lives. Uh, at Pearl Harbor during the Japanese sneak attack on December 7th, 1941, which will always be a day that will live in infamy. But for me, uh, let's take back that day in a way. Let's let's uh, not, not we will never remember or never forget to honor our uh, those who, who gave their life in the service of this country. But it is also the 40th anniversary 
of Star Trek the motion picture. On December 7th, 1979, Star Trek the motion picture opened to uh, to the world. And tomorrow is its 40th anniversary, which I find astonishing. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you my experience about seeing Star Trek the motion picture for the first time in December 7th, 1979. I was 12. I was 12 years old. And this event was in my young life, one of one of truly in the life of a young imagination, a budding imagination connoisseur. This was perhaps one of the most exciting moments in my life. Now, I had watched Star Trek religiously since I was five. And it it was my religion, and pretty much, even though I was being raised Jewish and I did have to go to Sunday school. Later, I went to Sunday school and Tuesday school, and I had to learn Hebrew and I was bar mitzvah and all that. But be that as it may, every night at six o'clock at night on weekdays on Channel 11, KSTW, I think, in Seattle, Star Trek aired. Now, for whatever reason, my mom says I was three, but she was wrong because it hadn't gotten into strip syndication yet. But it had to have been when I was like five o'clock, uh, five years old. And I watched Star Trek. I, and not only did I watch it, I had to watch it. Like my my parents ended up buying a small black and white TV, which literally it it well it did suck. It didn't literally suck, but it was it was a bummer. But they had to buy a black and white TV to put it on the dinner table so I could watch Star Trek. Because if I couldn't watch Star Trek, I was very very upset and unruly. And you know, I didn't even like it. It was, it was really difficult because I didn't like uh, I didn't like people to talk. I when I was even when I was a kid, I couldn't handle it. I'm like to to watch Star Trek was a holy thing I mean, everyone knows i mean you know my love of star trek is 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 uh well documented but growing up being a star trek fan in the 70s was great because we had the animated series in 1975 franz joseph uh released of course the star trek technical manual and the enterprise blueprints and they were designed as if they actually came from the 23rd century and then throughout the 70s, there were the photo novels that came out. There were the Star Trek novels that were being published. We had the James Blish adaptations. And I was young enough that not all of them had come out yet. Star Trek 1, Star Trek 2, Star Trek 3, Star Trek 4. I remember, um, I remember. I mean, my mom, uh, when I started collecting them as a kid, I was buying them with my allowance. And then one day, my mom just put all of the remaining books that I needed in my bookshelf because... Uh, she didn't like the fact that I would spend my allowance on books, uh, or but I, why wouldn't I? But I was there were model kits that were coming out. I was obsessed with Star Trek, obsessed with Star Trek. But other than the animated series, there was it was done. I mean, Star Trek was a TV show that ran from 1966 to 1969, and that was it. You know, that was it. And the animated series ran 22 uh, episodes totally. And, um, I thought that was, that was, that was all we're going to get. That was the, that was, that was what Star Trek was. You'd collect books and comics and the comics back then we'd get gold key Star Trek comics that were drawn by Italians that had never seen the show before. There were still model kits coming out. The exploration set came out. It was all, it was all wonderful, but there was no, there was no idea in my mind that there was ever going to be ever a, uh, any more Star Trek after the animated series? Like, that was it. Like, why would there be? Now, for those of you who don't know, during the 70s, there were multiple times when they tried to revive Star Trek because in 1972, when the series went in to strip syndication, that was also the time, which means it would play on independent TV stations for anybody who wanted to put it into syndication. Uh, it became more popular than it was even when it was on television originally from 66 to 69 and also the first star trek convention happened in 1972 so there was this groundswell of of fandom that was burgeon a burgeoning fandom for star trek that that hadn't really existed that started to organize and we saw the first of the conventions and people were really into star trek and you had college students you had people from all walks of life and star trek was not yet uncool because you were coming out of the 60s counterculture into the me generation of the 1970s and there was a lot there was a lot going on and once it went into syndication and the popularity of Star Trek was apparent Paramount 
realized that there could be more Star Trek. There were attempts made to make more Star Trek. And the first of these attempts was actually a feature film that was going to be directed by Philip Kaufman. And Philip Kaufman later went on to direct movies like The Wanderers, the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and famously The Right Stuff, one of my favorite films of all time. I believe he, uh, the unbearable, I think he directed the, it was the unbearable lightness of being or Henry in June. I don't remember, but he directed one of those. And uh, he's an incredible filmmaker. He came up with a story for Indiana Jones and, well, actually Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, with George Lucas. He, he came up with the idea and the character of Indiana Jones with George Lucas. So he was going to be directing a movie called Planet of the Titans. And that was the first Star Trek movie that was going to get made. And what's interesting about that, why it's important now is you had the great production designer Ken Adam working on it. You had Ralph McQuarrie, the artist who designed an enterprise, an updated enterprise for that series. And the basis of the Star Trek Discovery on the new Star Trek Discovery uh, has its origins with that design of the Enterprise. Well, for various reasons, Tashir Mifune might have come back and played a Klingon, which would have been amazing. But through various uh, things, it didn't happen. And then after that, they were going to make a Star Trek II, Star Trek Phase II television series. And the whole cast was going to come back except Leonard Nimoy. And uh, it, it didn't, they built sets. They had done costume tests. Persis Kambata was going to play Ilea. And of course, they had the character of Decker. And that was going to get made. And, and then in the wake of Star Wars' enormous success, Paramount decided, I'm making a, a long story, very, very short, to make a feature film. Star Wars changed the landscape of Hollywood. Everybody was clamoring for big budget uh, Tiffany science fiction movies. Up until that time, if you look in the uh, the 70s era of science fiction films before Star Wars, the pre-Star Wars era, it was very dystopian. I mean, you had everything on the, the heels of the Planet of the Apes movies. You had movies like A Boy and His Dog. You had movies like The Ultimate Warrior, The Final Program, or The Last Days of Man on Earth. You had The Omega Man. You had Soylent Green. You had Rollerball, Boy and His Dog. Did I say that already? There was a lot of uh, what I just received uh, in the mail yesterday, Slaughterhouse Five, the great jo George Roy Hill's adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Slaughterhouse Five. Slaughterhouse, Slaughterhouse Five. I can't even speak. So, so uh, Logan's Run, of course. Science fiction was very dystopian, and after the success, the resounding success of Star Wars, that was not. Um, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't know how successful Star Wars was going to be. Well, it was enormously successful at the time. It was the most successful thing that Hollywood had seen back in 1977. It really changed the thinking. Now, it wasn't the first blockbuster. We'd seen a lot of movies in recent years before Star Wars, like The Exorcist, like Jaws, that had huge, were doing huge boffo box office. People were lining up. People love movies. Long story short, Paramount decides to make Star Trek the motion picture. And as many people know, they locked Star Trek The Motion Picture into a release date. And that release date was December 7th, 1979. And why that is important is because, because of what were called blind bidding laws. What happened with, with movies is that because theater owners got ripped off, there was, uh, there was a, a law passed which basically said that no longer could studios have movies that were coming out that theater owners couldn't see before they bid on the rights to screen them in their theaters. They're, they weren't going to allow that anymore. So what happened was when they would lock a movie into a theater uh, uh, or, or when they were going to make a film, they had a release date, they usually had to show a movie to a studio unless it was a property like Star Trek. And what would happen was studio studios would have theater owners or theater chains would bid on the right to show a movie in their theaters. So when they announced Star Trek The Motion Picture in the wake of Star Wars, that was going to be a big budget movie, um, it, it, it theaters bid on it. And tens of millions of dollars of money was collected by Paramount before the movie made it to theaters. 
and, or the promise of that money. So they were locked into a release date. They were locked into a December 7th release date. It had already been pushed once since the summer, so it was going to be December 7th. So Paramount had to deliver Star Trek The Motion Picture to theaters on that date. Now, that said, today in The Hollywood Reporter, there is an article that was written by David Weiner uh, in their Heat Vision column. I'm going to read a little bit about uh, this because this is a great sort of quick overview of Star Trek The Motion Picture. The headline is, This is Probably Going to Kill Us, How the First Star Trek Movie Avoided Disaster. In the decade following its 1966 series debut on NBC, Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek managed to travel far beyond the final frontier, despite being sent into the spaceship graveyard after only three seasons. Driven by devoted fan fervor, the wagon train to the stars had already demonstrated its staying power with a strong second life, thanks to local television syndication, a Saturday morning animated series, Trek conventions, an explosion of merchandising, and a finger on the pulse of the pop culture zeitgeist. Encouraged by the phenomenon, Trek had become, uh, had become and maneuvering to launch its own TV network. Paramount began retooling Roddenberry's series for a live-action return to television to be known as Star Trek Phase Two. after flirting a few times with the concept of a big-screen outing. Then in 1977, the one-two punch of George Lucas' Star Wars, followed by Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters, broke the box office mold and changed the scope of how audiences demanded their sci-fi escapism. With the shifting genre appetites growing stronger and with Paramount struggling with the reality of selling it forth, TV network to a broad enough market, then President Michael Eisner pulled the plug on Star Trek Phase 2 in November of that year, just days before it was set to begin production. This, by the way, is important because it factors into why Star Trek The Motion Picture was, at the time, one of the most expensive movies ever produced. On March 28, 1978, Eisner and Chairman Paramount Chairman Barry Diller held a huge press conference on the lot to announce that Star Trek The Motion Picture would premiere on the big screen as a $15 million production, complete with the show's original cast and big-name director. At the helm would be Robert Wise, who directed the sci-fi classic Day the Earth Stood Still and won Oscars for The Sound of Music and West Side Story. Now, what was amazing about this is is $15 million was not chump change in the wake of movies like Star Wars and Close Encounters, both of which cost less than $15 million. This was a big, this was a big deal, not to mention the fact that you're bringing a television group of television actors. This movie was not being headlined by a star of, say, the caliber of Paul Newman or Robert Redford. They were going to go back and bring back the original actors, which is insane. I mean, at the time, it truly was an insane, amazing, magical thing that they were putting together. Quote, finally, when they settled on making a big movie with a Class A director, Robert Wise, that put it into a whole different category, William Shatner tells The Hollywood Reporter. They had many opportunities to present it to the public, and they chose the large screen. It provided an opportunity for Paramount to see that Star Trek would translate for theatrical audiences. Bob Wise was hired because of his expertise in making what you would call an epic spectacle, says visual effects director Douglas Trumbull, recognizing the inherent pitfalls of adapting Star Trek from a, quote, lazy, quiet little sci-fi television series into something worthy of the widescreen. They didn't get it. To turn that television show into a feature film was an idea that really actually scared them. Reassembling the crew of the USS Enterprise, we all know who they are, years after the end of its five-year mission, with added pivotal Starfleet characters Decker and Ilea carried over from Phase 2, the plot of Star Trek The Motion Picture raised the dramatic stakes with the deadly threat in the form of an alien entity called V'ger, a massive space cloud heading on an intercept course with Earth determined to meet its maker. The plot of Star Trek The Motion Picture originated from an idea Roddenberry had of a NASA probe returning to Earth, now sentient after melding with a superior alien intellect. Star Trek, the animated series novelist Alan Dean Foster, or it was called Star Trek Logs, that was the animated uh, novel series, Alan Dean Foster turned the idea into a story in thy image meant for the Phase 2 pilot episode. 
and Roddenberry wrote a script based on the idea as well. Prolific TV writer Harold Livingston stepped in to turn the concept into a more cinematic screenplay, and that process would be plagued with ongoing rewrites that continued well into production, thanks to the constant back and forths with Roddenberry, Livingston, studio executives, and input from both Shatner and Nimoy in the mix. By the way, interestingly enough, Gene Roddenberry was paid $400,000 to write the script uh, novelization of Star Trek the motion picture. A lot of people think that it was Alan Dean Foster who ghost wrote that novel. It is not. Roddenberry actually wrote it much to the chagrin of his fellow screenwriter Howard Livingston. He was, or Harold, did I say Howard? Harold Livingston, who was not happy about Roddenberry's payday. Anyway. <clears throat> Thanks to constant back and forth with Roddenberry, Livingston, studio executives, and input from both Shatner and Nimoy into the script, Livingston would ultimately share screenplay credit with Roddenberry with story credit going to Alan Dean Foster. Shatner says that working alongside Robert Wise was a real motivating factor for him as he was happy to take directing notes alongside a master. Quote, we had this marvelous man who had a reputation that I hovered around. I stayed by his side a lot. One of the things I learned that I've carried with me as a director and as an actor was that I never leave the set to maintain the emotional through line and sustain it from the time you arrive to the time you leave. And you do that by being a part of the flow of the construction of a movie and breaking it down to the construction of a shot. You stay in it by being there. By the way, I can attest to that personally because when I directed Free Enterprise on our longest day, which was a 16-hour day, which we had pre-planned to go overtime as 16 hours. Shatner was there the entire time. So he's uh, he, he lived by that. After so many false starts in various forms, Star Trek The Motion Picture commenced principal photography on August in August 1978, and the reality of standing on the set of the Enterprise Bridge once again was not lost on Shatner, even if its big screen look had been upgraded to a more sterile aesthetic. There was an enormous familiarity, says Shatner. On the other hand, it was too new in that we had time. It was a comparatively leisurely pace to the TV routine. Much of said pace had to do with the film's incessant script tinkering, with the cast and crew often waiting around for new script pages, sometimes down to time of day time stance, stamps on script sides, and having to manage constant change in dialogue and setups. That time afforded Shatner and Nimoy the ability to focus on improving the film's troubled climax and lack of humanity in the script. Two actors came up with what they thought was the solution to the weakness of the film, says Shatner. In the past, like we had done on the series, Leonard and I would try and come up with constructive thoughts or two that sometimes had merit and sometimes didn't. So we'd sit on one or the other of our dressing rooms and spitball what we would do for a change. It was really vital to making the film more human. He adds with a chuckle, I remember vividly I performed the changes that Leonard and I had written for Robert Wise, and he's like, oh my God, that's great. Let's bring it to Gene Roddenberry. So later that day, I did another performance, and my performance failed to convince Gene to make the changes. We walked out of Roddenberry's office, laughing over the fact that the matinee was good, but the evening performance was not as good. Despite the constant changes to accommodate the evolving dramatic story, Shatner recalls that there was plenty of levity on the set. In front of the camera, the story was going to kill us off, and we had to avoid being bemused. <laughs> and we had to avoid being bemused at least, at the very least, by it, he recalls. But off screen, we did play around a lot. As the final shooting day with the original cast loomed, there seemed to be very little optimism that the crew of the Enterprise would get another shot at a big screen adventure, a sentiment that was actually that would actually stick with Shatner for each Trek film he worked on. Every time we finished the film, they burned the set. Shatner reports, that was it. That was the end of it. Thank you very much. It's going to be wonderful. Hope to see you again sometime. Nobody ever, ever said, come back in two years and we'll get ready. We'll start a script right away. Nobody ever said that. Always. Six to seven films. Instead of storing the sets, they thought it's not co cost effective. We'll burn them every three, four, or five years. Paramount would change management, so they weren't about to invest in the long term. The boardroom is only only interested in immediate profit. Investing in basic expenses doesn't interest a lot of people. Well, that's not entirely true. They kept a lot of set pieces, and a lot of the sets were in fact kept. Famously, uh, the Voyager, the Starship Voyager's engine room, actually used the matter-antimatter intermix chamber we saw in Star Trek The Motion Picture. It was even reused on Star Trek Voyager. As the cast and crew were wrapping up the acting chores on Star Trek The Motion Picture, a visual effects nightmare was unfolding elsewhere on the Paramount lot. 
Special effects pioneer Robert Abel and his team, tasked with creating the big screen spectacle of the Enterprise, the Klingon battle cruises in action, V'ger in space, and more, had failed to produce anything that could be effectively used on screen. One of the problems with the movie was Robert Abel and Associates, the original effects company, like they just said, couldn't deliver. They had no effects. And with a release date looming, they were shooting all the live action and they had no effects for the movie and they were falling way, way, way behind. Computer-driven effects were new at the time, so everybody was struggling, recalls Shatner. It took more time than they thought possible. According to Douglas Trumbull, who later came on as the visual effects supervisor, that's quite an understatement. They hadn't completed any shots and nothing seemed to work, and the studio was terrified the movie wasn't going to make its release date. In fact, the Paramount Brass was in a state of panic, having collected a reported $30 million in blind bidding advances from exhibitors on the guarantee they deliver Star Trek The Motion Picture for a December 7th release. They had already pushed the film back from a summer release, and theater owners had gotten wind that the film might get pushed back yet again. Realizing the need to replace Robert Abel and his team fast, Paramount looked in-house to Trumbull, who had demonstrated his visual effects flair and expertise on SFX-heavy films such as 2001, Close Encounters, and Silent Running, which he also directed. Douglas Trumbull famously went on to do the effects for Blade Runner. But Trumbull had no desire to work on Trek. He had bigger fish to fry. Already under contract with Paramount to develop advanced forms of cinematic entertainment with his company Future General Corporation, Douglas Trumbull was developing high frame rate technologies, video game concepts, a flight simulator prototype ride that he says Disney copied for Star Tours, and more. He had no interest in rescuing Trek from its decaying orbit until the behemoth began to infringe on his productivity and resources. Paramount was so obsessed with Star Trek and the programs related to it that they completely dropped the ball on all the things I was doing at Future General, says Trumbull. As I was under contract, they kind of had this feeling that they owed me and would force me to do something like that, and I didn't want to. According to Trumbull, questionable behavior by certain individuals forced him to take action. They started poaching my employees from Future General Corporation to go to work on Star Trek, and then they started poaching the camera systems and optical printers and stuff that I'd been amassing at Future General Corporation, he says. I tried to just try to kibosh the whole idea by taking the cameras apart and putting the critical movement movements of the cameras in a safe deposit vault in Beverly Hills. So even if they got the cameras and took them from me, they wouldn't work. By the way, I've never sold, told anyone this story publicly. This is in the Hollywood Report, folks, today. Then Paramount consultant Richard Urichich, 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 an, exper Urichich, an experienced visual effects supervisor and director of photography who had worked with Trumbull on Close Encounters and later Blade Runner and Brainstorm, asked his friend to come back on board to get Star Trek back on track. The big, this big meeting took place, recalls Trumbull. Barry Diller made this big speech to the effect that the studio was being threatened by a class action lawsuit to break the back of blind bidding, and they had to get the movie done no matter what. Then he left the room in a rage. <laughs> Sitting in that room, armed with his lawyers, Trumbull took advantage of the leverage he had over Paramount to help rescue Star Trek and struck a deal to gain control of the assets and patents of the technologies he'd been developing at Future General. Then he and Juricic hatched a strategy that would require going back to the drawing board literally. They would have to take over five sound stages, implement reshoots, and farm out surplus effects chores to get the job done. We had to figure out how to get it done under the extremely difficult circumstances of having as many shots as Close Encounters and Star Wars combined in Star Trek. And we have to do it all in seven months, <laughs> remembers Trumbull. We realize this is probably going to kill us because we have to try and find fast and effective solutions for all the challenges. And that's how we came to the conclusion that we should split the project up. Trumbull enlisted the help of his former silent running protege, John, John, John Dykstra, and his post ILM team at Apogee. Don, John Dykstra, who had created the Dykstra Flex motion control cam, uh, camera system that worked on uh, Star Wars, he was the visual effects supervisor, came on board with Douglas Trumbull to handle such sequences as the opening Klingon battle scene, the destruction of the Epsilon 9 space station, and select V'ger effects. And Trumbull started by focusing his attention on rebuilding the USS Enterprise lighting aesthetic to his more cinematic spe specifications. That was the star role in the movie. It had to look really spectacularly beautiful. 
As it stood, the centerpiece of Star Trek was lit flatly with a key light and a fill light like it had been done on the series, and that wasn't going to fly for Trumbull. The Enterprise has to be able to travel through interstellar space where there's no sun or no moon to light it up. So what justification could you have to light it up that way, says Trumbull? My solution would be to have it light itself up. I'd seen this on a lot of really high-end aircraft. If you go to LAX at night and just watch how some of the planes are lit up, they have lights on the fuselage that shine up onto the tail fan, for example, where the logo of the airline is. And they also have landing lights that actually shine onto the fuselage. So I thought, why don't we do something like that and make it so that you could basically turn it on from the inside, similar to what we did with the mothership on Close Encounters from the third of the third kind, which was all lit from inside and didn't have to fill or key anything. So this, you know what, this article is a really long article, and I, I was going to read more and more about it, but gosh, rather than continue to read on it, why not talk to you guys, and I'll put the article, you can read the rest of the article here, because um, for whatever reason, I'm mealy mouth today. Uh, but anyway, so the production of Star Trek The Motion Picture was, uh, it, it was rushed, and the version that hit theaters on December 7th, 1979, uh, was always thought of by Robert Wise as a rough cut. It was never really finished. It was never really refined. They didn't have a lot of time to sit back and watch the film. They were just busy cutting it and getting it done and dropping in visual effects. And famously, uh, when they were putting the prints together at the studio, I, I guess there was a sound stage that was that was opened up, and they just kept putting finished prints out on the sound stage. They were still wet. They were getting these prints and putting them out all the different reels. And they had to be delivered all across America to anybody that wanted to, to show the film. So it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Cut to me. Uh, for the year before Star Trek The Motion Picture opened, I had a little calendar on my door to my bedroom that was counting down the days because famously Star Trek The Motion Picture's release date was known. It's the first time I ever knew a release date of a movie. And I had a little calendar that I would... I would uh, countdown and of course on the back of comic books there were ads with the the banking before bob peak the great bob peak painted his famous star trek the motion picture artwork that you can see in the thumbnail of this chat uh it, it was uh it was a, a a picture of the enterprise banking i think mike minor might have painted that picture i'm not really sure i don't remember but uh i have that poster i actually have that poster which one day i should frame and put up but uh it was very exciting and for this star trek fan I mean, I was already, Star Wars had come out, uh, Alien had come out earlier in the year, in April of, of 79, as we approached December 7th of 1979, I, I, I just, I couldn't wait. I was, it was, it was incredible to me that this, this, and remember, I was still watching Star Trek every night. I was watching it every night and reading all the books, you know, I'd read Spock Must Die and Spock Messiah. I think at that time, Bantam was still putting out, or Bal Balantine, no, Ban I think it was Bantam. And there were there were Star Trek novels like The Starless World, or World Without End, or Trek to Mad World, or The Galactic Whirlpool. Some of those might have come out after the motion picture. You know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not really sure, but all the way up through the late 70s, they were publishing books. And in, in 1979, there was a bunch of marketing deals that were made for Star Trek, a lot of marketing deals because of Star Wars. So there was um, uh, Pocket Books had made a, and their 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 uh, subsidiary Wallaby had made deals to start publishing new Star Trek novels. They were going all in. The first of their Star Trek novels was going to be the novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture, followed up by Vonda McIntyre's novel, The Entropy Effect. Vonda McIntyre was a well-known science fiction writer, and she was going to start up a new series of novels that, by the way, 40 years later, is still running even today. They're still publishing Star Trek novels. They recently republished Roddenberry's novelization for the 40th anniversary. And if you want to read some bonkers Star Trek, read the novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture. And if you're not convinced, go to our Inglorious Trexperts, uh, the podcast, The Inglorious Trexperts, which I'm uh, a guest a rotating guest on did a great episode about the novelization for Star Trek, the motion picture. And if you don't want to read it, go to that episode and listen to it. Cause Darren Dockerman does a mean version of Gene Roddenberry. But anyway, so uh, Star Trek, the motion picture came out. And, and for me, 
I wore a Star Trek costume. It was the only time I've ever cosplayed in any kind of a Star Trek costume. I, I went to seventh grade. I was promptly taken into the girls' bathroom, and, and Mike Elfendahl sort of beat the shit out of me. And it was uh, not fun. I also was accused of cheating on my fifth period earth science test. Uh, I was just couldn't wait to get out of school. I wasn't cheating on anyone's. I wasn't looking at anyone's test. I was just gazing off into the distance, fantasizing about seeing Star Trek the motion picture later that day. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I've, I've probably told this story, but I was so excited. So I get on this bus. I've got my Star Trek technical manual with me. I was that excited. I was wearing these Star Trek the motion picture uh, buttons on my, I mean, I was, it was not accurate cosplay or anything, but I was wearing the movie buttons on my tunic. I was very excited by the time. And I, I, I talked to people. I had to take two buses to get to the John dance theater in Bellevue, Washington to see star Trek, the motion picture. And when I got to the theater, um, there was a, a, a massive line. Uh, it didn't occur to me that there would be this big of a line at the time. Star Trek had one of the largest fan organizations ever on planet earth the pssst the puget sound star trekkers and they were a huge group when i got to the theater i wasn't going to get in and i was standing that this true story i swear to god this happened so i was standing in the back of the line and i just i had been beaten up in the morning i got accused of cheating on an earth science test by the way i got sent out into the hall and i was standing in the back of this line not going to get into the movie and i i i just started crying <laughs> i mean but like really crying because i this is like the biggest day of my life at the time and i was i was completely crying and what was really interesting and 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 this is the i don't know what happened i don't know if the great bird of the galaxy himself was looking down on me but as i was taking these buses there was a couple of people that were older than me like older kids i don't know if they were in high school or what they were also on the bus going to the theater and they were we were talking and I'm just like crying, crying, crying. And, and, and I'm trying not to look like I'm crying because I'm in line. I haven't left yet. And then I get tapped on the shoulder. And it was one of the, the, the people that were I was talking to on the bus. And they were like, hey, man. And I'm like wiping tears away, pretending I'm not crying. And they go, yeah, we're at the front of the line. Why don't you come hang out with us? Because they liked the fact that I was like little. I was 12, you know. And so they took me to the front of the line. And I was there. There I was at the front line. I'd like, I couldn't believe it. And then they opened. This is the craziest thing. It's it's the first time and only time this ever, ever happened in my life. I want to say the first show was like at 7 o'clock at night. There was no afternoon show. It was 7 o'clock at night. And they opened the theater at like 4 or 4.30. And they just let people in. Because there was a lot of people dressed up and everything. And now the John Dance Theater was huge. It was a giant box. And it was split into two sections. So you'd walk in, there was a walkway, and there was the lower part, and then there was the upper part. But it wasn't a balcony. It was just, it was a huge theater that was just split up. The upper part was higher, but it was still like a sloped floor. But so I was, the people I was with, we all went into kind of the upper part and the front of the upper part. So when you're sitting at the top of the upper part, you're, you're looking almost straight at the screen. And, um, so I'm in there and I, I got like the perfect seat because I was one of the first people in. I'm like, and I was I was by far the youngest person in the theater, by far. So then people start having Star Trek trivia. You know, people are throwing out, you know, what's uh, what about that episode? Or people are asking questions and and nobody knew the episode titles, and and that frustrated me. And so I, I kind of would go, I'd go, yeah, that was uh, Requiem for Methuselah, or that was Who Mourns for Adonais, or that was Balance of Terror. And then I don't know who, but somebody said, well, then you moderate. <laughs> so there I was, 12-year-old me, in a theater full of fanatical Star Trek fans that were much older, and I'm moderating Star Trek trivia. And then I started just asking questions because pe people were not I, – I didn't deem their questions worthy. So I saw Star Trek The Motion Picture, and then afterwards there was local news, and I got interviewed, and I was on the local news <laughs> – <laughs> so it went from being a bad day to being, you know, one of the greatest days of my life. And I have to say that um, a lot of people have, have, have talked a lot of things over the years about Star Trek, the motion picture. Now, before I get, before I get to 
that before I get to my review of what I think of Star Trek The Motion Picture. I missed a super chat on December 4th from Loquacious Primate, who said, uh, this is a great question. It's, it's a little divergent right now, but I, I forgot to, to answer the super chat. I didn't see it. It came in after I went off the air. Loquacious Primate asked, are you concerned about James Bond being demasculated? Well, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of talk since the No Time to Die trailer came out that Lashana Lynch, by the way, I've I've seen Lashana Lynch now talk like in her as, as uh, like a human being, not as talking in the movie trailer, but as a as a real person. I love her. Her personality is is amazing. And I can't wait to see her as a double O agent in this movie. Apparently, whether she's a double O seven or not, she's being cagey about it, which leads me to believe she probably is. I am not at all worried about James Bond being demasculated. I am worried about James Bond's. I mean, he's been the butt of people's jokes before. Uh, Blofeld once said, "Making mud pies, 007. And of course, Q always gave Bond shit. So it's not. It's not people giving Bond a hard time is nothing new in the series, and I just hope that you know they don't play him as the doddering old man who doesn't get what the young people are doing. I, I'm not worried about it. Um, it's I certainly didn't get that from the trailer, but uh, you know you never know. You got to wait and see the film. But let me let me uh, just get to these chats before I get to my review of Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Uh, Mark C is here. You your show needs to head somewhere out there that away. It is, and Mark C is quoting uh, James Kirk. Uh, my show is heading somewhere that away, and it's gonna it's gonna. I'm telling you. Where this is episode 290, uh, December 15th, by the way, for those who, who might want to know, December 15th is my actual one year anniversary of doing Rob Observations. Rob Observations started on December 15th, 2018, and December 15th, 2019 will be my actual uh, one year anniversary. Now, I don't know if I can, I'm going to try and, and aim for the 15th being my uh, uh, my 300 show. That's my goal now. And if it's Sunday, for those of you who might be interested, my 300 show is going to be 300 minutes long. So that's five hours. I will be debuting. I'll be on the new set. I'll be on my... And I, you know what? I'll just flat out say it. Of all the people have tossed out a lot of names to me, my moderators have. A lot of people have come up with the same name. And when you get more than two or three people saying the same thing... Uh, the new set where I'm going to be will be the Robservatory. <laughs> Rob observations will be coming to you from my Robservatory that will be filled with with omnibuses and action figures and novels and and all kinds of of goodies. I will be completely surrounded, multiple cameras. It'll be all lit up. It'll be colorful. It'll be may. It'll be amazing. So December fifteenth for the three hundredth show of Rob observations from the Robservatory. So there you go. So Mark C, that's where the show is headed. J.B. Bonifacio says, <laughs> Mandalorian Episode 5 is my fifth favorite episode, but by no means an episode I hate. Filoni is still a Padawan compared to Chow, Howard, and uh, Famuya. From, 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 I can't, Rick Famuya, director. Uh, I have to say, we talked about it on the, on the show this morning, on the John Campy show, I, I really thought that the Mandalorian episode five was very lackluster. Now, it's it's one thing to be servicing Western tropes. I like that. But but I thought with the fifth episode, I was hoping the last four episodes of the show would be heading somewhere narratively that we would we would find out. I I I find that it's it's interesting to me that the Mandalorian, the eight episodes, maybe because I've been so spoiled by great serialized television, they don't seem to have a purpose. The Mandalorian just seems to be wandering around the galaxy. Uh, I don't know what he's, where, where is he going? Uh, you know, we don't know. I don't know if he knows. And I thought, while I enjoyed watching the episode, I thought it was very interesting that we have an episode with uh, already in the Mandalorian with Jawas, and a sand crawler, and this episode we're back on Tatooine. 
I mean, I know we weren't on Tatooine with Jawas and a Sandcrawler, which was already confusing enough because I thought Jawas were either indigenous to Tatooine. So apparently Jawas are spacefaring, but Tusken Raiders are not. Um, while I enjoyed a lot of the way the Mandalorian was done, I thought the fan service became annoying. How many times do you have to hear phrases? A lot of carbon scoring here, like we pointed out in the John Campia show. I, I, I thought that that the fifth episode of The Mandalorian, like you, JB, was a, a huge episode or a huge step backwards for the show. And look, I like Dave Filoni. I've never met him personally, but every time I've heard him speak or seen him in interviews, I, I really like him. But, but his directing chops are clearly not nearly up to par with everyone else's. And he's directed, he wrote this episode too. I believe this is the first episode that was not written by Jon Favreau. And it just, I, I was shocked by how little uh, it brought anything new to the show. There was really, we learned nothing. Uh, there was no, people talk about this being a filler episode. I wouldn't even say that because there's no narrative thrust that I I feel that we're, we're moving away from. I don't know what's happening in this show now. I, I don't. And I, I feel like while the Western tropes are interesting, I get it now. Now what I need to see is an original storyline that the Mandalorian is going to tell me, not just a pastiche. And by the way, not a very sophisticated pastiche either. It's a pretty, I would dare say, simple-minded pastiche of Western tropes and uh, not a big fan of this episode. I'm still enjoying the show overall. Richard Ford says, there's always satisfaction in shipping a product you worked on long and hard. Well done. Well, we're not shipping it yet. We, we, we have to show it. The first time anyone sees it, people of importance. My fellow producer, Joel Zwick, was the director of my big fat Greek wedding. And John Levin, who was our sales rep, was the vice president of the Creative Artists Agency for 30 years. So these guys are fairly heavy hitters, and they have a lot of powerful friends. And it's uh, they saw an early iteration of the film for the first one time it was ever shown in a theater to people so we could get a, a, a vague notion of where we're at. And we are going to screen it for them on the 18th, which is pretty interesting. Um, but yes, Richard... I, I, for the first time, I'm ready to show this people, and I really, I, I'm ready to show the film to people, and I really feel that it is complete. It's complete for what it is. You know, it's like I said, it's not Avengers Endgame, but uh, it, it for what it is, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the work everybody did, and and it really, I think, is a shining example of the quality you can bring to low budget independent movies. Mark C also is here again and Mark C says per Vanity Fair Monday we'll see the release of the first trailer for Ghostbusters Afterlife I'm excited to see that for those of you who might not know there's a series on Netflix that dropped called The Movies That Made Us that is made by the same people that make the toys that make us or made us and they did they dropped four episodes about the making of certain movies Home Alone Dirty Dancing Die Hard, and of course, Ghostbusters. All the, the show is a lot of fun to watch. I highly recommend it. The Ghostbusters episode is very entertaining. Jer Mananen is here. Jer says, awesome day. It is Independence Day here in Finland. Wow, I didn't realize you're in Finland. Uh, or did I realize you're in Finland? I Well, happy Independence. Um, one day I would like to get to Finland. Uh, that would be that would be a lot of fun. I would love to come there. I actually had uh, my friend Jolie von Sur, who's like my sister growing up, she actually went to Finland when we were in high school as an exchange student for a year and couldn't say enough good things about it. Tibula the Spider Monkey says, can't stay. I'll watch when I get home from work, but I wanted to drop you some quatloos while you're live. Have a great show, buddy. Well, thank you, Tibula the Spider Monkey. Uh, Jet Screamer says, the Enterprise was breathtaking on the big screen. Uh, Rick Berg says, it was breathtaking on the big screen. It's still breathtaking. I'm always, I love that scene so much. I, I think it's amazing. And uh, Kirk's reaction to the Enterprise, I never get enough of that. Rick Berg says, theory was that Voyager 6 came across Nomad and was sent to Tan Roo's homeworld. Well, that's, of course, a reference to the second season Star Trek episode, The Changeling. There have there have been criticism uh, levied or or or. or made against Star Trek the motion picture that it was too similar to the episode The Changeling. And the, the episode The Changeling has the nomad probe, probe colliding with an alien probe Tanru. And when they 
when they were um, uh, reassembled, they, they created what we saw as Nomad in the, in the series, and that that was similar to Star Trek: The Motion Picture. And, and I, I, I understand that. I do understand that. But what's interesting, remember that the at the time the in thy image idea that that Alan Dean Foster came up with, the Voyager probes that were launched in the seventies were a big deal. They were a big deal. So they this came after uh, the original series. And so the idea that they put a record album on the side of the Voyager probe that would have all the sounds of Earth, which you can now get, you can download or get, you can find versions of that record. You can hear what we put on it. Greetings in many different languages. And there was schematics that showed what mankind looked like and mathematics programs and all that. They were on the Voyager probes. So I really do believe that the idea that Voyager was intercepted, and by the way, the same the same idea was used at the beginning of John Carpenter's Starman. Uh, this probe was intercepted by an alien race, you know, and and I I think in a way it was a the the the, the, the notion is is similar, but I don't think the episodes play out nearly the same, and I'll get into that later. Will Yang says, sorry, but I really don't like Love Actually either. I spent the entire movie wanting to reach through the screen and strangle half the characters. Well, Willow, I, I can understand that. Um, a lot of people don't like Love Actually. I love Love Actually. Um, there's a lot of things about it that I I, I really like. Uh, the Hugh Grant story as the Prime Minister and uh, was it Marlene McCutcheon? Or I, I just I, I adore all that. But yeah, I can understand you feeling that way. There's a lot of people that don't love love actually uh and i i get it i totally understand i don't hold it against you i know you're not a hopeless romantic or maybe you are but what i get from you is you're not but that's okay um jay canada says loving the energy today curious if you like knives out better than death trap in 1982 which i missed over the years and want to blind uh keep up the great work well jay i gotta tell you that's an interesting question I don't love I really like Death Trap a lot. I thought Knives Out was really great. I I really did. But I thought it's almost like two movies in one. There's the build up and then the reveal. And I thought the reveal, you know, it didn't deal with a lot of the character. It was sort of it was it was it became more of a a typical who done it, but I I really enjoyed watching it. It's beautifully made. And I really loved all the performances, but I think I might have found Death Trap to be overall more satisfying. It's funny. I haven't watched Death Trap in a long time, but I own the Blu-ray. Uh, I have it on Blu-ray. Um, uh, Chief Cook says, I would like to see Star Trek IV do a remake of the motion picture. Well, Chief, that that could might be a good idea, but I, I would rather not. I mean... I really think that there's there is so many we we now live in a science fiction world and there are so many interesting ideas coming down the pike that our our, our modern science fiction has proposed and our own world uh th ethical quandaries that we find ourselves in I I would really like to see them tackle something else. I think Star Trek the Motion Picture did it right and I'll, when I finish these this series of questions I'm going to get into talking about what I think about Star Trek the Motion Picture. Culture Inject is here. Says why would a new TV show currently on hiatus after filming the first episode swap one established costume designer for another? Joss Whedon's The Nevers swapped Jane Petrie for Game of Thrones Michael Michelle Clapton. Uh, that is a good question. Um, first of all, when you film the first episode of a series, that's that's generally considered the pilot episode. And when they film a pilot, they really look back and find out what worked, what didn't work. A lot of the time, they retool the pilot. It's famously, with Game of Thrones, their first pilot was scrapped. They were allowed to make a new first episode. And that's what we we all saw. So I would imagine they, after the first episode, they reassessed. They just they made a change. They made a change, and uh, it's not unusual for that to happen. Mark C says, I had a Star Trek... By the way, thanks for supporting the channel, sir. Uh, Mark C says, I had a Star Trek The Motion Picture poster growing up that I lost in a flood. The Enterprise front and center with small frames of six space vessels, two being a Klingon cruiser and a Vulcan shuttle. If you know anyone who has it, let me know. Well, I think I do. I think I have that poster. I don't know... 
I I got my poster from somebody at Paramount actually, and um, I it's not as the full size. It's not a full size one sheet. It's not twenty seven by forty one, but I I it was a promo poster. That was probably what you had. I cannot part with mine though. I I apologize. Stubble McShave uh, I can't speak today. Stubble McShave says. Do you think an unlimited budget stimulates or hinders creativity when making a movie? Does limitations make you more creative and look for solutions? First of all, yes. Um, having a fixed budget for a movie is absolutely how you find you how you make creative decisions. And I think having an unlimited budget uh, never uh, never helps anybody necessarily. I mean, with an unlimited budget. You, you you sure you could do whatever you want, but at the end of the day, does an unlimited budget serve? Remember, when you're making a movie, you are making a product. You're making a product for a marketplace that uh, you can judge how much the market will bear, how much how much you're going to get for your product in the marketplace. Now. One of the things, there's a misconception about Star Trek that when it was being made at the time that it was this cheapo show because people look back and they make fun of the production design or when the when the Enterprise crew does not go on location and beams down to a set, it's obviously a stage-bound set. Or people talk about the visual effects of the original series not being up to snuff. Well, I would like to dissuade anyone of that opinion. When Star Trek the motion picture or Star Trek the original series was being made, it was not cheap. And at the time, they had groundbreaking special effects that had never really been done on that scale for television before. Blue screen photography, compositing. I mean, they did some amazing stuff in the original Star Trek, and they were constantly fighting their budget. They always wanted more money. But look, I will say, when you're working on any project, no matter what it is, even if it's a $200 million movie, you always want more money to do things. Because when you're thinking on a certain level, uh, all of the movie comes up to that level, so it it costs you <clears throat> more money. But remember, when you're making a film, I think I think one of the great problems with Star Trek, especially in the the last ten years of Star Trek, the 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 custodians of the franchise have badly produced Star Trek. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that they what they're trying to do is they've been trying to turn Star Trek into something that it's not. And that's true of the three Bad Robot, J.J. Abrams, hell, uh, the, the three movies that Bad Robot made, two helmed by J.J. Abrams, one hell, helmed by Justin Lin, and Star Trek Discovery. They did not take any lessons. The way, the way that current Star Trek is being made now is diametrically opposed to the way Star Trek was made under the Berman era or the original series made in the 60s, which was you, you make your, your show on a fixed, limited budget and you, you choose your battles. Star Trek Discovery has so many visual effects and so many digital effects because I think that there was a, a misapprehension uh, of, of how the show should be made. And there is a fundamental lack of understanding that you should be able to make a great Star Trek story set in a room if you have to, as evidenced by the second season Next Generation episode, Measure of a Man, or the Deep Space Nine, the penultimate episode of the first uh, season of Deep Space Nine, Duet. Now, if you look at Star Trek Discovery, they... Um, they spend uh, just ungodly sums of money. Even their set design, their sets are huge as far as TV sets go. They're giant. Captain Pike, the, the captain's ready room sets are huge with, with, with reflective floors and all of that. I mean, I, I look at Discovery and I'm like, and I get they want a cinematic look for that. And they've, they've switched in the second season to a new aspect ratio. I get all of that, but uh, they're spending way too much money, just like they spent way too much money on the Star the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. And what happened was they weren't nearly as profitable because of it. You know, Star Trek, the motion picture, famously, I've heard the budget quoted most often as being $44 million. Now, in 1979 dollars, that was a lot of money. But the reason that it cost that much, did the movie cost that much to make? No. But what they did was they wrapped up all of the costs the development costs of the Planet of Titans movie <coughs> and the Star Trek Phase Two television series 
were wrapped up into the budget so the studio could recoup. So Star Trek The Motion Picture did not cost $44 million. Now, I've heard it cost maybe $25 million, but that's all part of, you know, you're making a Star Trek movie, the studio still spent that money, they still have to get that money back, and Star Trek The Motion Picture was a way to do that. And by the way, Star Trek The Motion Picture was, was very successful. They were very happy with the amount of money that the film made. But the the J.J. Abrams movies, especially Star Trek 09 and, and Into Darkness, most of all, but they uh, they spent a lot of money, a lot more money than I think they should have spent because once you can do that, if you've got that money, you're going to spend it. Nobody's going to say, hey, it's going to be 107. The vision that we bring to, to bear on the screen is this much money. The movie shouldn't have cost that much. If they'd cost less, if you'd made Star Trek 09 for $100 million, instead of well, whatever it costs, 150, 175 million, would have been a much more profitable movie. Um, but it, that takes, to know how to produce that way, you have to have really experienced producers who are not thinking in terms of, oh, well, we can, uh, we storyboarded all these shots, so we're going to just go make all these shots. I mean, no, the great thing about Star Trek has always been, how do we tell great stories and not, not utilize visual effects as a crutch, which so often they are in the new in the new movies. Uh, Stubble McShave also says, "Do you? Th uh, oh no, it's Mark C. Mark C. I already said that. I already answered that question." Mark C. says, "If I recall st correctly, Star Trek: The Motion Picture was the first McDonald's film tie-in Happy Meal. That is correct." Now. Here's what's very funny. In the wake of Star Wars, the, 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 this is such a, I feel bad. The Mego Corporation, the Mego Corporation who made the world's greatest superhero figures, the Planet of the Apes figures. I mean, they made everything from Wizard of Oz to Big Jim in the 70s. They were a huge toy company. They famously missed out on the Star Wars license. The world might have been a very different place had Mego got the Star Wars license. They didn't. And after the success of Star Wars with what, what Kenner did with the toys, Mego was constantly looking for licenses. And in 1979, they had the license to make both Black Hole and Star Trek The Motion Picture toys. Now, toys are predominantly, of course, geared toward children. Maybe not so much today with high-end collecting. But at the time, Mego was hoping both Disney's The Black Hole, which came out two weeks after Star Trek The Motion Picture, and Star Trek The Motion Picture would be a bonanza for licensed toys. Now, if you ever wanted as a child action figures of Ernest Borgnine and uh, Yvette Mimay <laughs> and, of course, Anthony Perkins, uh, the Black Hole, those toy line, I mean, they made three and three-quarter inch figures and they made 12-inch action figures, which are actually pretty beautiful. And they also did the same for Star Trek, the motion picture. Unfortunately, those toy lines did not did not really sell with kids. Uh, what a what a weird Christmas 1979 was. You could get black hole toys. You could get Star Trek The Motion Picture toys. You could get a giant Kenner alien to play with because doesn't every little kid deserve a chest-bursting xenomorph that basically rapes their victim, implants an embryo in that victim's stomach, and then bursts forth? All I know is that when I got that alien toy when I was a kid, that was, that was awesome. I love that. So anyway, what... What did I think of Star Trek The Motion Picture? As I have famously said, Star Trek The Motion Picture is my favorite Star Trek movie, bar none. And one of the things that, that a lot of people today don't understand because Star Trek, especially in the last 10 years, Star Trek has become something that it wasn't. It's become the zip, slam, bang action franchise. They've, they've completely changed what, what Star Trek fundamentally was, which was... Sure, it was an action-adventure show uh, seen through the prism of, of science fiction, but it still was very thoughtful. And, and the writing, some of the writing in the original Star Trek series is amazing. Now, why did I love Star Trek The Motion Picture so much? Well, first of all, it was the first time you got to see Earth of the 23rd century. And everything about Star Trek The Motion Picture for a diehard Star Trek fan like myself was brand new. We'd never seen Starfleet Command before seeing the brand new Enterprise. So we'd seen Vulcan, but not, not writ large on the big screen the way it was. We didn't see Klingon battle cruisers. We didn't see the Klingons ever doing something on their own. We only ever saw Klingons uh, dealing with the, with the Federation. 
So immediately from the get, Star Trek The Motion Picture was fascinating. I was completely entranced by it all. I thought it was the way it developed. It's almost like a mystery. What's out there? What's going on? I just was entranced by this. And what I thought was really interesting and what people never, and I've talked about this on the show before, what people don't give enough credit to Star Trek The Motion Picture for is that it took the Star Trek universe forward in time. Now, uh, presumably it, it's only two and a half or, or maybe five years after the end of the five-year mission from the original series, and there's been a lot of changes, but the fact is our characters have changed and grown and the ships were redesigned, but it felt real. There was, for me, peak verisimilitude in that movie because it felt like I was watching a universe that had moved forward, moved forward in time, and I loved everything about it. People make fun of the uniforms now. I like them. They, they seem to work. They seem like what you would wear on a space voyage. You'd want to be comfortable. I loved when Captain Kirk is revealed, my, my favorite hero from, from media fiction. I, I, his reveal, his Admiral uniform is one of the coolest, still to this day, one of the coolest uniforms anyone's ever worn in a movie ever. There's a reason why Peter Weller they brought back that sort of that design for Star Trek Into Darkness. I love Shatner's performance. I loved all the performances for the most part in the movie. But what I think is, is the best thing about Star Trek The Motion Picture is, and by the way, I encourage everybody, this week on the Inglorious Trexperts, this Saturday, we, Brian Fuller, who co-created Discovery, and he worked on Deep Space Nine and Voyager, producer Brian, F Brian Fuller, who also created Hannibal, joins the Inglorious Trexperts to talk about Star Trek The Motion Picture and how he felt about it. And it's a fascinating conversation because what he has to say is really, really, really insightful. And I, I dug it. But for me, the, the, the entire Star Trek The Motion Picture story is really Spock's story. And, and it's, it's one of, as far as characters go, in the entire Star Trek franchise, Star Trek is the most important story I think ever told about one of our main characters. And uh, famously, back in the early aughts, director Robert Wise got back together with a core team of, of very enthusiastic special effects artists and producers and redid Star Trek The Motion Picture and finished it in an acceptable manner that Robert Wise called the new version of Star Trek The Motion Picture his director's edition, where they were able to recreate storyboarded but never finished visual effect shots they went in and they added scenes to the version uh, to the movie that made it better and i think the the real um the real story of star trek the motion picture is spock's story and especially if you watch the director's cut because it, it has moments in it that are just there that are just shattering but what's really interesting is that spock in star trek the motion picture is trying in the beginning to get rid of not not necessarily the fact he can't get rid of his human dna but because he's a half vulcan half human he's trying to complete the colonar discipline which will purge all remaining emotion that might reside within him when we know it's there because we've seen it a few times and in the beginning of star trek the motion picture spock fails at this we've never seen spock really fail and he fails uh, at the Colonar discipline because he has felt this consciousness calling him from space. The ultimate logic, what Spock, what Spock is feeling in space is exactly what he hopes to become, which is a creature, an, a person, a Vulcan of pure logic, unfettered by useless hu human emotion. And he knows that, that V'ger is out there. And because he's failed with the Vulcan masters, they tell him, his answer does not lie with us. Well, after this incredible failure that Spock doesn't isn't used to enduring, he feels I, I need to go. I need to go out there and find out what what's calling me from space and the answers I need. How do I become the person I want to be? How do I become free of human emotion and become this creature out there? Is the ultimate form of logic I've ever experienced. I need to go find out what that creature's secret is or what that entity's secret is. And Spock, when we meet him, when he shows up in the Enterprise, he is not in a great place. He is, dare I say it, obsessed. 
And at the same time, we have a, a, a Captain Kirk who wants to get the Enterprise back. I loved all of that. He doesn't like to be. He's been head of Starfleet operations for two and a half years. He's bummed out, you know. So, and then you have Dr. McCoy, who's been studying, as we know from the novelization, Fabrini medicine. And for those of you who are Star Trek fans, the Fabrini are the people that live on the asteroid in the episode for the world is hollow and I have touched the sky. And Dr. McCoy has been studying Fabrini medicine. medicine. And so he gets called back to the Enterprise. So our main characters, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, are all sort of um, not in a great place. McCoy doesn't want to be there. Kirk really wants to be there, but isn't there uh, for for real, he's just taking over, and so and then Spock is looking for answers, and you've got McCoy who's kind of caught between the two of them. McCoy is of course Kirk's Kirk's conscious conscience, and uh, I love this movie, and I think that what's really interesting over the course of especially the director's cut, one of my favorite moments in all of Star Trek, indeed all of televised science fiction, happens when Spock goes and mind melds with V'ger to find out what's up. He comes back and he realizes what he has discovered in confronting V'ger is the opposite of what he thought. And he, through his mind meld with V'ger, what he has come to realize, which is a fundamental change in the character of Spock and what any great story does with its main characters, especially franchise characters, is you if you can change the fundamental nature of a character, that's a big deal. And they didn't kill him and they didn't make him worse. But the moment in Star Trek The Motion Picture where Spock takes Kirk's hand in sickbay and is trying to explain what's up with V'ger and what, what V'ger wants, he takes Kirk's hand, his best friend in the universe, and says, as their hands are together like this, Spock says to Kirk, this simple feeling is beyond V'ger's comprehension. And at the moment that he mind-melded, he realizes what Spock has been doing in trying to purge all remaining human emotion is exactly the opposite of what he should have been doing. And what he should have been doing is embracing this side of him because that's what makes him unique. He might be the only Vulcan that has the emotional insight that Spock has. So the whole time he's tried to be uber Vulcan and the, the best that he can be, but he realizes finally that his human half is useful. And in doing that, he's able to help V'ger continue and finally end its journey and to meld with the creator or whatever happens the the greatest the greatest uh let's just say the greatest act of uh, <laughs> reproductive energy the universe has ever seen is is expended at the end of star trek the motion picture and and a new life form is born that presumably realizes the value of both uh, both emotion and pure logic and and ascends to a higher plane i mean these are heady ideas and these are ideas that are worthy of star trek i mean look as much as i like star trek 2 star trek 2 did not make me think did not make me contemplate the universe did not make me contemplate who i am as a person or where i want to go nearly as much as star trek the motion picture and i loved the way the cosmos is depicted in star trek the motion picture uh i i love it so so very much and you know a lot of people here's when people throw out criticism, now I'm not saying Star Trek The Motion Picture is beyond reproach. It certainly isn't. I, I of course, know that Star Trek The Motion Picture has pacing issues. For me, they I, I surmount them in my own mind because flying around the Enterprise, to me, in Star Trek The Motion Picture is almost sexual in nature. I find that ship so goddamn sexy. So fly around it some more. I get all that. Flying into V'ger, I understand all that. But remember, at the time, we had audiences that were... We were only 11 years out from 2001 and 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 the trippy headspace, the laserium space of the 70s and all of that. Um, I think Star Trek The Motion Picture is making a point about the cosmos itself by through its pacing. Now, the problem with Star Trek The Motion Picture is the theatrical version is a rough cut. It's not nearly as refined, so it's rough around the edges. But to me, and I've said this a million times, to me, the Star Trek that I loved, the reason I love Star Trek, I got more of that Star Trek from Star Trek The Motion Picture than any of the other Star Trek movies that have been made since. I've maintained uh, always that if you watch Star Trek 
the series. I could give you 10 episodes of the original series to watch. And then you watch Star Trek The Motion Picture, you'd be like, oh, this is a great continuation. The problem is the superficial joys of Star Trek that a lot of people key in on, the, the pop culture-ness of the original series. I never considered Star Trek to be campy or hammy or anything. I took Star Trek very seriously, and some of my favorite episodes, whether it's the Doomsday Machine or famously the Immunity Syndrome, if you watch the Immunity Syndrome, which is also about penetrating a very strange cloud and finding out what's at the center of that cloud, the tone is very similar to Star Trek The Motion Picture, and the Immunity Syndrome is one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek, and when I saw Star Trek The Motion Picture, I'm like, oh my god, a lot of my favorite things, the mystery, the, the wonder and the strangeness of the cosmos, all of those things are retained in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Is it a slam-bang action fest? No, but it's contemplative, it's really interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you something, uh, I am not nearly as eloquent as Brian Fuller is when he's talking about Star Trek The Motion Picture on the Inglorious Trexperts, but listen to what he has to say, and I tend to agree with it, because it's fascinating fascinating stuff and i i watched star trek the motion picture i went and saw it at the fathom event in the theater again i found it just as captivating as ever you know i really hope we've been waiting for almost 20 years for a new high def version of star trek the motion picture the director's edition now famously it was only finished at standard def and a very short-sighted i mean we didn't have hd tv yet it, but hopefully I know that there's there's maybe some progress being made toward getting a new remastered version of Star Trek, the director's edition, the motion picture, the director's edition. I'd love to see that. I mean, tomorrow is the 40th anniversary. Maybe somebody will make some kind of an announcement. You know, we can hope because I, I'm a huge, huge Star Trek, the motion picture fan. Now, does that mean that I that I don't like Star Trek 2? No, I love Star Trek 2. I love Star Trek 4. I like Star Trek 6. But to me the evolution where Star Trek should have evolved into is the, the, the elevated level of what Star Trek, the motion picture demands of its audience. I find the rest of the Star Trek movies, all of them to be very, um, they're on, they're, they're, they're a very populist. They're very, it, it became a very populist film franchise. And I understand with the kind of money they have to spend, but I maintain that if you, if you had gone in a different direction with the Star Trek film franchise, and remember Star Trek two was made by the TV division of Paramount. So they brought the costs way down and that's how the Star Trek film franchise was made. Even the next generation. Remember when they were making their films, they were still done as television shows. Basically that's how they were produced and uh, by the production team that did the TV shows. And I feel that Star Trek The Next Generation did not make an evolutionary leap. I think it needed to, at least in terms of storytelling. Maybe we'll see that evolutionary leap in the Picard series. I don't know. But who knows? I, I just think that um, Star Trek The Motion Picture is what I wanted a Star Trek movie to be. And I got it. And I've loved it. And in my mind, it, it took the material that I love so much and took it to another level, which is what I think uh, uh, should happen. And I would like to see more of that. Uh, you know, I felt that one of the things I didn't like about Star Trek 09 was it was very simple. All of the characters were archetypes we'd seen before. You know, Chris Pine, I, although I very much enjoyed his casting as Kirk, he's basically Maverick from Top Gun. I, I didn't see Captain Kirk in there. Nobody went back and, and really uh, made an effort. It was a very, everything that we've seen of modern Star Trek is a cursory, superficial understanding of what Star Trek is and is supposed to be. And I think that's a bummer. And I that that's what, more than anything else, when people say, oh, how come you, Rob, you're always talking about how come you hate Star Trek so much. And I think ultimately because it's been dumbed down. And it's funny because whenever somebody gives a vaguely Star Trek-esque speech, they're like, they roll out that clip. See, see, it's it's just like the original series. No, no, it's not like the original series. It isn't. And and Star Trek the motion picture to me was was the example of now. I understand. Do I think it's a perfect movie? No. But but like Star Trek itself, to me, the motion picture is an episode like the immunity syndrome. Um what we needed more was even Star Trek II was more balance of terror. Star Trek was an, essentially an anthology show that had the same characters every week. Every episode was was wildly different, really. And they had the same characters, but you never knew what you were going to get. 
And I wish that the Star Trek movies, I mean, now it's become the villain of the week show. Every time we've seen a Star Trek movie, ever since the end of the original series, um, we basically had, there have been villains. Generations even, the next generation, you had Soren, then you had the Borg, then you had the Sona, then you had the Romulans. There was always these villains. And the thing is, Star Trek never really had villains. Star Trek has antagonists, which are different than villains. And I, and I think that's a, an, an important distinction. Even the original series movies suffered from, once they had Star Trek II, thank God we had, we had uh, The Voyage Home, because The Voyage Home, again, has an antagonist, but not a villain. And it's also got a situational problem that we need to overcome. And I, I think that that's the direction you should look look toward. But uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, to me, it's a great Spock story, especially the director's edition of the film. And I really, uh, it's my favorite Star Trek movie. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark C. says, you are correct. The poster on question was one of three from a promotion that threw Crest toothpaste. I just found the info. I don't know if the one I have is a Crest, Crest toothpaste poster. Maybe it is. That's kind of interesting. Rick Berg says, yeah, I always appreciated the care they took reintroducing the character ship and backstory of something we love after 10 years. Star Trek, the motion picture. Yeah. Chief Cook says the TNG crew took the motion picture crew with more people. Um, oh, the TNG crew should look the motion picture crew with more people. I don't, I don't quite know what you're getting at there, but, um, what's interesting all to all of you to answer these questions. What's interesting is what I think Star Trek, the motion picture does really, really well that modern Star Trek doesn't is how it does reintroduce not just the characters, but the universe. It's all very interesting. Remember we meet Spock on Vulcan. We meet Kirk going to see Admiral Nagura in Starfleet headquarters. Uh, it's very interesting in the way it deals with canon. Everything felt of a piece. The design of the Enterprise, uh, it all felt real because they're like, okay, they had um, um, people like Mike Miner and they had real artists that were really Andy Probert, the people that were designing the new Enterprise. They were industrial designers. They really understood things and like, okay, if this is going to go here, then this is true and that's true. And they really knew what was up. And I think that 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 was what was important. Everything sort of felt real. I mean, there were missteps. Like they tried to make the wrist communicators or communicators inside your head. I mean, that was those were interesting attempts. But even even the jackets, the overcoats they're wearing when they go on on the deck of when they go outside of the Enterprise into the oxygen bubble that V'ger's created and go to see the central command, the brain of V'ger. Even those jackets were really interestingly designed, and and um, uh, I really. Uh, everything about Star Trek: The Motion Picture to me is is how you evolve these kinds of these kinds of shows, and one of the things that I also loved about Star Trek, if even if you didn't like the uniforms per se, because they weren't they weren't as I don't know as 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 they were more utilitarian than anything else, the universe that was being portrayed in Star Trek: The Motion Picture felt real. One of the things that they did was the way they used color and they used the Delta Shield to delineate um, rank and to delineate which section you worked in. All of that was really well thought out. And, and they took, the, there was the evolution, uh, the, the Delta Shield with the, the Chevron, the Star Trek Chevron with the circle and, and around it, the, the pin that Admiral Kirk wore, the insignia pin. All of this stuff was really well thought out, uh, really well designed, and and you you felt like the people that were working on this film, they really knew what they were doing. It's all it's all held together. The design work really holds holds together well. And yeah, it was also the first time where there was a massive canonical departure that you had to deal with, which was the look of the Klingons. And a lot of people have always brought up to me, they're like, "Well, Rob, you know, you're such a canonista." You're always talking about Star Trek canon and all this, and how do you how did you how did you make sense of the fact that the Klingons looked different? And I'll tell you something that never really bothered me, and I'll tell you why it never bothered me. Because when I was watching Star Trek, you know, 
in my mind, I would say, okay, there's there's many different aliens. Why would we assume that? And Star Trek, what's funny is Star Trek, the motion picture did a good job of, you didn't really see them there in the background. One of the things that they were promoting when the movie came out was all these alien designs that are in the film. And you see a lot of them on the rec deck scenes, but in the books and the things that were coming out, the tie-in stuff for Star Trek, the motion picture, you saw these pictures of the aliens. And I was like, all right, well, these are just Klingons we've never seen before. If you have a vast Klingon empire... Well, and and there were later there were there were ideas postulated in various Star Trek role playing games or books <coughs> that we had been seeing the the uh, that the Klingons have many different they have more humanoid species within them, but the Klingons that we saw in the motion picture were the Imperial Klingon race. They were they were the they were the heart of the Klingon Empire. We just hadn't seen them before in the series, and if you think about it, we didn't see the Klingons that much. So the redesign of these Klingons, and indeed, if they were the imperial Klingon race, <coughs> I always thought, I'll buy that. We just haven't seen them before. You know, but but after seeing those Klingons for many, 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 many episodes of Star Trek to go back and sort of retcon their design in Star Trek Discovery became, it's very difficult to go back and watch, for me, Star Trek Discovery, watching the evolution of Star Trek over 50 years and Discovery rolls in and says, this is canonical Star Trek, and then nothing looks the same. Because, you know, if you were to shoot the original bridge of the Enterprise, and I know, I've shot the original bridge of the Enterprise, is recreated by James Cauley. If you go on there with modern cameras and you light the same set, whether it has the jelly bean buttons or not, depending on how you shoot it, it would look absolutely modern. People would not think that the bridge of the Enterprise is dated. And that design, I mean, to me, when I look at Star Trek 09, I look at the production design, I'm like, I don't believe that. I just don't believe the colors, the lights. I don't, they did not make me believe. The Enterprise design in Star Trek 09, I don't understand why it looks the way it does, other than on paper, somebody thought that looked cool. In Star Trek, the motion picture, everything, the universe feels real. The characters feel adult. You know, there, there's a lot going on. You've got Ilea and Decker. You've got Spock and V'ger and Spock and Kirk and McCoy. Then you've got Kirk and McCoy. You know, then you've got Spock and Kirk. There's all these different, there's a lot going on with the characters. And I find the story fascinating. And I can't believe I was 12 years old 40 years ago. And I that's when I saw that movie. And um, I had a bad day that turned into a very good day seeing Star Trek The Motion Picture. And, you know, to this day, the, the way the Enterprise looks in Star Trek The Motion Picture is the best. The Klingon battle cruisers, the Katinga class upgrade of the D7 battle cruisers, they look amazing. The Vulcan shuttle was cool that we, we'd never seen before. And even the interior of the Enterprise, you finally understand how it all works out. And seeing all the characters come back, I mean, at the time, people will never understand now because when you go back and you judge things without context of history, if you weren't there and you just try and watch it, and I'm not saying that a movie has to work only if you know the historical context because it doesn't, it doesn't, but it helps. And you you have to take into consideration his, the history of something before you can really judge it because part of the history of it is how it should be judged. And at the time when Star Trek the Motion Picture came out, it was it was amazing, first of all, that it existed at all. And two, it had never been done before. Not like that. Luke Beckett says, having a prison movie fest at my house, Midnight Express, Papillon, Cool Hand Luke, Shawshank Redemption, Green Mile, interested? That's actually a good idea. Um, but you're not going to go for like any women in prison movies, stuff like Caged Heat, Exploitation Films. Uh, women behind bars. I mean, I'm all about that, but that's a that's a very highbrow prison movie list. I uh, I dig it. I think it's good. A, a fine list. Uh, I'd be interested, Luke. Why not? I don't really have time now, but uh, definitely. Of course, uh, those of you who are interested in the movie trivia showdown, you might be seeing me tomorrow at the big live event in downtown LA, um, which should be fun. Jay Bird the third says, I don't think Hollywood is capable of creating a modern equivalent of Star Trek the motion picture. Current Trek writers lack the experience and the intellectual acumen, and special effects houses lack the restraint to avoid overdone CGI. Well, Jay Bird the third, I think you're onto something there. I honestly think that, you know, one of the big problems uh, of 
there is a there, I think there is a disconnect. I've I've seen I've covered it. When you have because the way the way special effects are done now, uh, there's they're previs by a previs house, and the way they're integrated into movies, sometimes the previs for a film is done way before the film is shot, and you're trying to integrate because everything is so effects heavy now. You have to do that, and you're trying to integrate these things into the shots that have been decided upon. I think that Star Trek Demands is definitely a show where less is more when it comes to visual effects. Star Trek has always been about people. The main center, the focus of Star Trek has always been about the interpersonal relationships that characters have, whether they're within a situation and it's never been about effects. And one of the things that I think they've gone way overboard on is visual effects and the design. There's no cohesion. The, the phasers and everything else, everything is much faster in the Star Trek, the modern Star Trek universe. They they don't understand that that uh, the pacing of Star Trek is even off these days. But I think you're absolutely right. I don't think anyone. I think modern Star Trek. I have not seen. For 20% of my life, I've seen Star Trek that I don't recognize, that I think is substandard, that I think is not very smart. And it's because we don't live in uh, the same kind of world that Star Trek we lived in in the 60s, that that whole spirit. I mean, I think one of the problems is that Star Trek is inherently optimistic, and we live in an increasingly cynical time. You know, every, everything is snark now. We live in we live in snark time. You know, snark trek is is basically the characters on Star Trek Discovery are certainly not uplifting. The characters I'm other than maybe the character of Saru. Uh, I mean, they're going to make a Section Thirty One show, a show about about. I can't imagine a more anti Star Trek thing to hang a TV show around than Section Thirty One, um, especially the way it's been portrayed in Discovery. It's Section 31 should always be mysterious, but oh, they demystified that real quick. I mean, that's another thing. The way they approach Section 31 to me is like, you guys don't get why Section 31 was great. Section 31 should never have been explained. You know, you hear it a little bit from Sloan. We know a little bit about it, but there's no... Section 31 doesn't have a base with a bunch of ships and a bunch of people that you can talk to. No. The face of Section 31 was one dude. You know, you don't know Section 31. And as soon as you start detailing Section 31, it gets demystified. And then it loses its potency. It loses its its power. But I think you're right, Jay Bird. I don't know if if anybody can make a movie like Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, Dave Felonius Monk says, Hi, can I get your thoughts on budget projectors? Well, like any piece of electronic equipment, that's that's a budget piece of electronic equipment. It's usually a, bu a budget for a reason. I'll tell you what I'm fascinated by as far as projectors go. I am fascinated, and I don't know much about them. I've been reading a lot about them. I've watched videos about them. I've read a lot of specs about them. Are these new uh, laser projectors that you're able to sit right up against a wall or a screen and project a large image? Now, um, I... I would need to play with them and calibrate them. See, I'm a real stickler when it comes to image quality. And uh, I, I I have yet to see other than in really high-end home theaters or like at my friend Bill Hunt's house, projection is something that I have been over the years less impressed by than say a good OLED or a plasma screen. But it's getting better. Um, but yeah, it really, you know what? It really depends on your eye. My my whole thing is how how great are the black levels, <coughs> first and foremost, and how vibrant is the image overall? How bright is it? And uh, if you've got, if you can find a projector that you like for, uh, I, again, I'd have to get into it. I'd have to really, really sit down and, and research it. But there's a lot of, of YouTube channels that do that. And I like to watch some of them. So I don't, I don't know exactly. I don't know I, I, off the top of my head. All I know is that those laser projectors, those close throw laser projectors are something I'm, I'm very much interested in. But my taste in uh, electronic equipment skews much, much more expensive, much to my, much to my chagrin. Um, 
Dieter Bastion says, how many times did Rob say Star Trek the motion picture during the show? The one person who gets it right wins Lucky Tiger products for life. Kidding. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I could wax rhapsodic about Star Trek the motion picture for a long time. But, you know, Star Trek the motion picture is something that um, it, 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 it asks something of the audience. You know, it really does. And uh, I think it's important. Um, Alvin Guzman wrote in a letter. He said, Hey Rob, that motorcycle bond scene is not a blue or green screen. It's a real crazy guy jumping that wall. Uh, in well, Alan is right. What I meant to Alvin is right. What I meant to say was in the, of course, no time to die trailer. There is a really cool motorcycle stunt. If you look on YouTube, somebody cut together a lot of behind the scenes footage. I don't know if it's official behind the scenes footage. Maybe it was leaked to look unofficial of that stunt being done. And what I meant to say was it's not a blue screen shot. It's an actual stunt as most of the Bond movie stunts have been. They just will use, they use blue screen to uh, take out the ramp and make it look like a staircase that he's riding up. That's what they've done. They've used, to me, the best use of visual effects. It's a real stunt done for real on a practical location, done really well, but it is a uh, it is a there's a VFX assist there to take out the ramp that they built so you can um, that you can you can see uh, uh, it's great what a great stunt Brian Eng says <laughs> it writes in if Mulan was in Chinese with English subtitles would that be too much verisimilitude for you no I mean honestly I would have preferred Mulan to be made in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> whether it was in Cantonese or Mandarin, uh, I would much prefer that and read subtitles. But obviously, Disney can't make a movie, um, a Mulan movie in English. I mean, uh, in, in Chinese. I, they're not that progressive yet. But that would never be. I'm I'm a big fan of foreign film. I hate watching dubbed movies. And I'll watch a movie like Mulan. I get it. It's set in the, the Middle Kingdom. I understand. Uh, but... Um, I, I I don't think anything. The more vils, verisimilitude, the better. Uh, I feel. Uh, I feel. I feel absolutely good about that. Um, uh, Dia Chowdhury is here. Dia Chowdhury says she wrote this, or he wrote this. Dia, I would say Dia. Maybe Dia is a guy. I don't know. Dia's uh, Dia. What a great name. Um, Dear Mr. Burnett, I ask you this question because you are an avid fan of James Bond. I really like James Bond and Miss Swan's relationship. So if anyone can speculate, I feel you and Mr. John Campia can. Yesterday, I wrote to him about the question I will leave below for you to answer. I hope that you will respond. Will Miss Swan die or reunite with James Bond at the end of No, Times, no Time to Die? Thank you very much. Sincerely, Dia. Well, first of all, Leah Sadu, come on. I don't want her to die. Do I think she will die? Unfortunately, there is a precedent for Bond's love interests to die in James Bond movies. Famously, of course, Teresa Bond dies at the end of Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Vesper Lynn dies in Casino Royale. Does Leah Sadu die? I would say 50 50 on that. Um, I, I think that. All, since this is going to be Daniel Craig's swan song as Bond, I I think that there's a good bet that we might see Madeline Swan die in this movie. Uh, I hope not, because I love her. She's she's just, I love her so much. I mean, you know, when people ask me about comic book movies, like, what's your favorite comic book movie of all time? My favorite comic book movie of all time my favorite movie that is based on a graphic novel or comic book source of all time is Blue is the Warmest Color. A lot of people are like, what? Blue is the Warmest Color. For those of you who know, you know. That movie kills me. Uh, I, I get so emotionally, and I understand that movie's steamy and that doesn't hurt. So is Betty Blue. It's a French film. But that film just kills me. It kills me every time. And uh, I love it. But Leah Sadu is in that movie. And I'm a huge fan of hers. I hope she doesn't die, but I think I think that I think it could happen. And you know, uh, we shall see. But but I I tend to believe that yeah, probably she's probably.
probably going to die, but I think it's 50, 50. I don't know yet. I don't, I don't quite know yet. We shall see. Um, Brian Eng says, I'm sure Mulan will be great, but wouldn't it have been nice if the director or producer or writer were actually Chinese? Yeah, but but you know what? Yes, to be on to answer your question, yes. Um, but I think that we should now start thinking. First of all, I isn't there a live action Chinese movie that a, a Chinese a, a mainland China film that actually it tells that story? Um, yeah, I mean, I would uh, first I would think, yeah, if you're going to tell a Chinese story, you should probably have a a director or a writer or a producer who's actually Chinese, that's probably a good bet. But, you know, uh, after all, it is Disney and and uh, uh, they're doing, I mean, <laughs> I would say the same thing of, of a lot of Disney movies. Aladdin, um, movies that are set like, like um, uh, Emperor's New Groove. You know, if you're dealing with a different part of the world, it's always better to have a native of that part of the world or native of that culture be involved with the production. No doubt. But unfortunately, there's a long history of that not happening. You know, I just heard a friend of mine was telling me about a Polish movie that was made in Poland where the Poles are actually playing Egyptians because the movie's set in Egypt. And I'm like, I'd watch that. I mean, I don't, I just hope the movie's good. At the end of the day, I hope the movie is, is, is good. That's what I would hope from those things. Ian Samuels is here. Ian Samuels writes in, and says, Rob, so the final trailer for The Rise of Skywalker was not, in fact, the last we were going to see of it before the release. We have been getting loads of TV spots that are starting to feel almost daily. Unless all of the extra stuff they've been filming for the last month has all been nothing but lies for these TV spots, we are going to end up being shown a huge lump of the film before watching it. I am getting nervous, especially with the latest Sith dagger. Are they revealing too much? There are some things, including the reveal of the Sith dagger that Ray gets, the fact that the TV spot <coughs> is called Sith dagger, reveals a secret that really have sh been should have been left for the film. I really hope that they don't overdo it, ruin the film by spoiling too much of these pointless TV spots. Well, Ian, I, I agree with you. Like, but that's unfortunately that's movie marketing. The one thing though you'll see is they just keep drawing on the same scenes. The way movie marketing works now is they usually draw from an, a couple of, not a couple, but say five five scenes in the movie, and they cut the trailer from those same scenes, and we keep seeing them over and over and over again. Various iterations, a new shot here and a new shot there. But I, I think that, you know, they one of the things they haven't really done is reveal any of the story. So even though you're seeing these images, and while if you've read Reddit leaks or you're following a lot of online chatter, there's a lot of, there's a lot of leaks that seem plausible. Everyone's talking about the reveal of that Sith dagger. Well, that might be so, but one thing I've learned in my life is that nothing, no matter how many TV spots or trailers you see, there's nothing better than actually sitting down and experiencing a movie unto itself. Even if you even if you know spoilers or anything, it's it's just not the same as actually seeing the film. So I don't think it's going to get ruined. I think what'll ruin the movie uh, will be the movie itself. The only thing we have to fear is the movie itself. So, yeah. Here's a another letter from Dean Mikitich, longtime imagination connoisseur and member of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. Hi, Rob and the PGS. With Star Wars gearing up to come out, we've been talking a lot about that. However, this letter is not about Star Wars, but mine and your first love, Star Trek. By the time you read this letter, the CBS Viacom merger has completed. It's true. The meld has happened, which means that Star Trek is back under one roof. No doubt fans will be out in the street partying. But we here at the Post Geek Singularity know nothing is going to change for the time being. Star Trek is still in the hands of Secret Hideout. And if the rumors are untrue that Alex Kurtzman has now been demoted to just being the face of Trek, Kurtzman as well. Sherry Redstone has got what she wanted with both companies coming back together, and she has been on the record saying that she hates what J.J. and Kurtzman have done or are doing to Star Trek. I've also heard that she holds Star Trek as the crown jewels in her portfolio, and she wanted to make that crown shine once again. 
So, Rob, with your knowledge of the film and TV industry, I'm curious to know what you think will happen to Star Trek over the next few years. With Sherry being the majority shareholder and sitting on the board of the reemerged company, will she use her power to oust Kurtzman in Secret Hideout? If she's unable to do that to the Kurtzman deal, will she have all the funding for his planned future projects, Section 31, and anything else that is not yet in front of the camera halted and just wait for him until his contract comes to an end? Though we in the general public don't know what Discovery's actual viewing numbers are, domestic or overseas, if they're as bad as the rumors say, would she have it canceled after the third season? This might be, be mean that CBS All Access will be ditched and the reset of the company following Paramount uh, Paramount's lead and do a deal with Netflix to their streaming service. What do you think she should get? Who do you think she should get to replace Kurtzman? And who would you like to see have creative control of Star Trek? With the next question, I doubt you will have an answer, but you might have insight. With the recent announcement of Noah Hawley directing the 14th Star Trek film, I understand that Bad Robot's film deal with Paramount has come to an end due to them not getting a film in production since Beyond came out, but they do get first option to make it. Do you think Bad Robot put this announcement out to drum up funding so they can renew their contract? Or do you think that with Paramount recent box office flops, they're hoping to put something out that is cheap but will make money? Finally, I would like to say that it was sad news to hear of DC Fontana's passing. Gene Roddenberry was the creator of Star Trek, but DC was the mother helping shape it into what we know and love, and then she came back to help shape the next generation. Having been brought up in a Christian home and being married to a Jew, I would like to wish you and your family a Merry Christmaka, the celebration of Christmas and Hanukkah, and Happy New Year. Peace and long life, Dean Mikitich. Well, Dean, thank you for writing in a great letter. What Dean is talking about, is since 2005, Paramount and Viacom, which owns CBS, have been bifurcated. And there's been a lot of talk of, of different licenses and different uh, contracts being made and, and all of that. And so now that there has been a refusion, the Faltor Pond has happened, the refusion, what you ask, haven't been done since ages past. Um, uh, I, what do I think about this? Well, one, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's great to have all of the CBS assets in one place. Here is my predictions about what's going to happen. First of all, I think CBS All Access will go away eventually. I really do. Unless they're going to put a lot more money into it and start creating a lot more new content. I think that the content that is being created for CBS All Access so far, whether I, I think the, the good fight, I watched a couple episodes of that. I, I I didn't follow The Good Wife. I've heard that show is pretty good. But it certainly is not enough to compete. Even with Star Trek competing on the streaming platform, the Star Trek that has been being made now is way too expensive. And they're putting way too much importance on it. Um, and we'll see. I mean, they put all of this. They've sort of, they've sort of, this, this decade, this era of Star Trek, Kurtzman right now, for what I under, from what I can see, You've got Picard coming out. You've got Discovery Season 3. You've got the animated shows that are coming out. And you've got this potential Section 31. Uh, we'll have to see how they all do. Because Paramount has been hemorrhaging cash. They're not doing well. What they're going to have to do is, I think, Star Trek needs... Uh, what it needs is competition. Star Trek as a franchise, first of all, it needs somebody who loves the franchise to run it. Somebody who is an experienced producer who's also a fanboy. It needs, as we've said, it needs a Kevin Feige. As a matter of fact, Kevin Feige should come over and run Star Trek because he loves Star Trek. I know he's not going to do that because he has Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But um, honestly, I don't think that there is anybody qualified right now who works in Hollywood that I know of that I think would be a great steward of Star Trek. Now, some people would say to me, well, Rob, what about you? That's great. I don't have the professional credibility to run Star Trek, uh, no matter what. I mean, it, I, I don't have it. I have not proven myself in, a, in, a, in enough of a, a, a way to uh, show that I can run Star Trek to run a TV show. I've never run a t TV show before. I've only directed five episodes of a, a, a Skinamax HBO late night show. I'm proud of what we did there, but you know, we shot episodes in three days. We had to shoot basically 10 pages a day, which was insane. So it's not like I could sit down and, and really figure out, okay, how can I make, how can I bring my vision to bear? 
But I don't think that there's anybody because because I don't think that there's anybody that loves Star Trek enough to make it their life's work. Remember, Kevin Feige was content to make the Marvel Universe his life's ambition. Now he can change. He's going to get because of his success. He's going to do. He can do whatever he wants now. But he committed, man. He committed, and he already had made thirteen Marvel movies. He'd worked as a producer on thirteen Marvel movies before he started the MCU. He came up and and basically he's concentrated on one thing. He's the guy got a PhD in making superhero movies, and then he went on and 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 then he created the MCU. It's a, it's a uh, there's nobody else like that. Now there's a cadre of people that I know that I mean, if I was called upon, there are people that I would go get. I would I would assemble a writing team of people that I know would do a good job that I that I could. I could bring in that all are great TV writers. They're great genre writers. What I don't understand, I'll tell you this, none of them are working on Star Trek currently with, with maybe one except, well, two, two sisters I know, the Benson sisters are working on a Star Trek animated show. I, I would bring them on to work on, on a show, but I would hand pick. I would go get 10 people right now. I could call them up in the next half an hour. If I ran Star Trek, I would call 10 people 10 writers, and I'm like, you're my hand-picked writer's room. And then I would start some parameters. I would actually sit down and go, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the kind of stories that we're going to tell. And then I would hire some really crack production people. Uh, I would hire a great, who I, who I also know who I would go go get and get these people. And we would, we would the, our, our mandate, the first thing out of the gate, we would make Star Trek for half of what it's being made right now. I would actually get all the budgets, the current budgets for every episode of Star Trek Discovery, and I would say, see these budgets? I would tear them all up. We are going to make every episode for half of what they have made every episode of the Picard show for and every episode of Discovery. Half. That would be the first thing I would do. <clears throat> but, again, <clears throat> I've never worked in television in that capacity, so nobody would pick me. But I don't think quite right now there's anybody who would take over Star Trek that I would be excited about. I think the problem with Star Trek is they fundamentally don't want to make Star Trek. They fundamentally want to make something else. But because Star Trek exists and it's a crown jewel, that's what they're doing. So let's change it and turn it into something that we understand and know. Why, why, why would you do that? I mean, I, I, I get why. I, I do get why they're doing that. But it's, it's been too expensive. It's not successful enough, and it's very unsatisfying. That's not to say people can't like it. But now Noah Hawley, very interesting, this Noah Hawley. Um, to me, Noah Hawley is an incredible creator of television. Um, I liked Fargo. I like what he did with Fargo. I love what he did with Legion. Very, very interesting. But for him to come up with an idea, I mean, maybe he had some great pitch, but to me it was a Hail Mary. I don't know if Noah Hawley will actually get to be able to do this. They didn't they didn't say there was contracts signed or whatever. I think it was Bad Robots Hail Mary in the face of this Viacom merger to go make a movie. He's made one movie, Lucy in the Sky. Look at how well it was received. Very interesting take. Um uh I I I don't understand how you go from making a movie like Lucy in the Sky as much as I admire what he did with Fargo and Legion which I think are great, but Lucy in the Sky, while I know why he chose to tell that story, and I really I really love where he went with it, um, I don't necessarily think that it screams that you should make the next Star Trek movie, nor do I necessarily think Quentin Tarantino's, while having, look, if you're going to get in the Quentin Tarantino business, you get in the Quentin Tarantino business. I mean, that's that's great. But I, I just think that the, the bad robot era and secret hideout era of star trek has not been as successful as it should have been and it is basically due to i think a fundamental lack of of understanding of what star trek was and maybe not a fundamental understanding lack of understanding but a, a, a fundamental desire to not embrace what star trek is and to turn it into something else let's make it more star wars and less intellectual that was it that was the mandate that was what jj abrams basically said why would you do that you know, what, what should have been done is, is here's, again, I keep going back to this, but instead of coming out of the gate 
trying to make big budget Star Trek. What you need to do is go pull back your vision and make Star Trek that is emotionally satisfying. You know, you don't need special effects. You don't need huge explosions. You don't need every other character with prosthetics on their face. You don't need giant sets that have to have digital representations or holograms or any of that stuff. You don't need that. And 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 that's why cut your budget, man. Cut them in half. Find people that can make your uh, that's what I would do. And I would concentrate on the core of what was what was the core of Star Trek? It was Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, the id, the ego, the super ego, the troika, and it was about their adventures and what they uh, and their crew and what was happening. It was not about visual effects. As a matter of fact, as an exercise, I mean, yeah, you're going to have to have a few effect shots, but go back to what they were going to do with Next Generation. We're going to build a, a, a library of visual effects, you know, that we're going to reuse, and with technology now. You know, with Next Generation, if you watch, they had a few visual effects of, like, the Enterprise going into orbit around a planet where they just recomped in. They had the shot of the Enterprise, the motion control shot, they just recomped in different planets. Well, nowadays, what you do is you go do the same thing. You create a library of shots that is basically plug-and-play, mix-and-match, you know, and that would be another thing that I would do. I'd go create a library of, of effect shots that would be multi-purpose, you know, and, and do that from the get-go. You have a library of planets. You know, Max Gable, who painted the planets for the next generation restoration. My God, you could just you could make an incredible library of ship shots that can be reused. I mean, there's so many ways to produce Star Trek effectively. Now, with the stagecraft technology they're using to make the Mandalorian, I mean, imagine what you could do to, to Star Trek. But you need, again, I don't know if there's anybody in, in Hollywood that wants that job. But um we shall see, but but I think I don't think Noah Hawley's uh, Star Trek Four is going to get made because that's that's Bad Robots Hail Mary. And if Sherry Redstone is indeed not as impressed as everyone thinks she is, if if she really doesn't like uh, Star Trek as much, um, well, we'll see what happens. I think what's going to happen, honestly, what's going to happen to Star Trek, I think it's going to become much more of a an individual thing. Like what I would like to see, honestly, I would like to see Star Trek become a, a, almost like an open source idea where where you would have different people come in and tell stories within the Star Trek universe that maybe aren't even canonical stories. Like if you went in, if somebody said to me that Star Trek Discovery was a different take on the Star Trek universe, like I've always believed that you start from scratch. You go back and you you keep your core concepts, but maybe reinvent the whole thing. So you're you're it's not canonical Star Trek the same way that Lost in Space, for instance, was a different take. It's it's not canonical to the original Lost in Space from the '60s or the the movie, the New Line Lost in Space film was a whole different take. Yet it's still Lost in Space, and that's interesting. I don't know, but we'll, we'll it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I mean, I would love to make a canonical Star Trek show. Sure. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be interesting to see. I just hope it's better. I hope it's better. <clears throat> um, oh, uh, Chief Cook says... Sorry, what I was trying to say was I think Gene wanted the TNG, uh, the next generation, to look like motion picture era style, right, with more crew members. Admiral Kirk is Captain Picard, Decker is Riker. Oh, no, okay, Chief. I, I, I totally agree with you. Absolutely. The next generation took a lot of cues from Star Trek, the motion picture. Uh, Riker and Troy are absolutely Decker and Ilea. Those, those ideas were absolutely uh, recycled from a hundred percent. So I totally agree with what you're saying. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't understand that, but yes, you are absolutely correct. Um, Mark C says, <laughs> I was engaged to a Jewish woman. Once I am Catholic. We called it <laughs> Chronica. <laughs> I love that Chronica. Um, yeah, that's all good. Mark C says, hey, Rob, Roddenberry didn't have the professional credentials to create Star Trek and get it on the air. If you see something you want, go get it. Fortune favors the bold. Well, that isn't true. I mean, you know, he had written 
the lieutenant, have gun will travel. He was a vital creative force already and a very accomplished television writer in his own right. He'd worked on shows before he created Star Trek. So yeah, I mean, he had a lot of, I mean, didn't he write like 25 episodes of Have Gun Will Travel? Um, that's a lot. He had a lot of, of television experience uh, before, a lot more than I have. And, you know, I would love to to oversee a writer's room. I don't even know if the Writers Guild would allow me to do that. I mean, I'd love, I think I'm a really good story person uh, in, in terms of script consulting and, and coming up with ideas. And of course, you know, I've written a couple of scripts myself. I, I'm I'm pretty good in terms of my <laughs> in terms of my level or how many scripts I've written. I've written in my life three screenplays, and one of them was produced. It's pretty good. <laughs> I've, my batting average is all right. Um, two almost got produced, and the third one I wrote could still get produced, but you never know. Um, but yeah, I think he did. I think Roddenberry did have have the credibility. And remember, he he was even a speechwriter for the chief of police, the chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. So he had a pretty interesting, prolific uh, uh, lead up to TV. Now I've worked in TV and I've worked in production. I mean, I've I've got a lot of experience. Uh, I think, to be honest, I could absolutely run a TV show. I could absolutely run a production. I, I I do. I do. I have run productions. Hell, I've run teams of people in foreign countries for a year at a time. So I could absolutely, I could absolutely produce a TV show. But I think the key, the key to making a great television show is you have to have great production people and you have a gr have to have a great uh, writing staff that really gels together. You know, you need a, a, a great television show is, is one of the most finely, tuned machines in Hollywood, even more so than a feature because of the speed with which they have to work. And I'll tell you, having a great team, having a, a, a finely honed production team on a TV show, there's nothing better than that. And you could, you could do amazing things uh, with that. And I think I could do it. It's just, I don't have the professional or commercial credibility to get that. I mean, I've got, I will continue doing that. Uh, I've got to stop making. I've I've got to stop producing movies once every decade, basically, uh, and hopefully I will be able to spend the next ten years really kicking things into high gear. There's a lot. There's a lot of things I have going on um, that that is leading up to that. So you know, we'll see. Either that, or I'm gonna slit my throat and leave the business forever. Maybe I'll leave the business forever and then slit my throat. But whatever. Things are as they said in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Dice are rolling. Uh, Richard Ford says, do you think the budgets for Star Trek Discovery are so high because producers' fees are a percentage of the budget? Are the incentives for bad robot against fiscal responsibility? Well, that's Richard, that's a really good question. Here's the thing. Everybody wants their taste. And Bad Robot is a very accomplished production company. They've made a lot of great television. But yeah. I, I think that one of the problems with Star Trek Discovery is when they got rid of the original production team, the original showrunner. Uh, they, they, there was exorbitant costs that that happened there, and you know every producer gets a gets a, a, a taste of that pie. You know Brian Fuller is still listed and will always be listed as co-creator of Discovery, and he gets paid for every episode. I don't know how much he gets paid, but he gets paid something. Now. Now, how many other producers have left that still get a taste? Um, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think that's really one of the problems with Star Trek Discovery is everyone wanted to jump on board because of how lucrative it was. You know, I, I think that, that I mean, that's just, that's how Hollywood works. Those are contract negotiations. And what do I always say, kids? What do I always say? You don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. And that is never more true than in Hollywood. Remember, everyone is trying to fuck you. They are. And you are not going to get kissed. And there's going to be no foreplay. There's going to be no, no oral, no rim jobs, none of that good stuff. No. You're going to get fucked in Hollywood. That's why you must, you must negotiate a rock-solid contract. Your, your entertainment lawyer is your friend. And, and when you're working in Hollywood, just, that's just... And, and and by the way, you don't have to resent that. Don't get angry about that. Just know that's what's going to happen. So when you go in and you make your deal, you know, just make sure you get the deal you want. You have. And, and by the way, what's great is you get a great lawyer. 
You tell your lawyer what you want and you let the lawyer sit back and do, do that job. Um, and, and here's the ultimate thing. And this is the hardest, here's, here's the hardest lesson, the hardest lesson that if you want to work in Hollywood or anywhere, anywhere, the hardest lesson, it might be a tough pill to swallow, but your greatest power is to say no and walk away, especially if it's something that's yours. If you have a project and you don't, you know, you you feel it's unfair. There is nothing worse than working under unfair conditions or feel conditions that you feel that you're 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 being you're being mistreated. You don't want to do that. And the greatest power you ever have is to nope, walk away. It's tough. It, it, I know every. It's so hard to get a project made. So everyone's like, please, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. Whatever you, whatever nasty, horrible things you want me to do to you, I'll do them. Just let me make my whatever it is. Don't think that way. And because remember, they are going to fuck you. And um, all you can do is is protect yourself through great great lawyering. And it's worth it. It's worth it. That and remember. 33% of your budget goes to post and don't let anyone tell you differently because that's lame. Uh, Jaybird third says Star Trek needs to find another Harv Bennett. He didn't know Trek when he got the job to make Star Trek two, but he studied every episode, took it seriously and also brought the right experience. Hey man, Jaybird, I agree with you a hundred percent. Star Trek does need a Harv Bennett, but the thing about Harv Bennett was he really understood like many people that came out of the business. He was a realist. He was like, I'm a TV producer. So I produce television. He's like, I'm only going to, I'm not going to only produce one kind of television. When he was brought on board, they didn't want to have another $25 million or $45 million uh, spend like they did on Star Trek, the motion picture. So they brought in Harv Bennett from the TV division of Paramount because he knew how to make things. And, and, um, uh, uh, Jack Sauer, not Jack Sowards, um, Robert Salen, uh, Robert's same thing. Bob Salen came in from the commercial world and he really knew how to, he knew how to produce a show and he, he was the producer of Star Trek two. And he's a nuts and bolts guy. One of the, one of the things about, about television production that you need. And I, I don't think a lot of people like Kurtzman knows this. You need to know physical production. To make great television, you have have to have somebody that knows how to physically produce a TV show. Now, creative producers are great. You need to have great writers, and you have to have a great visionary showrunner. That's great, but you also have to have a visionary showrunner that's completely working in tandem with a line producer who knows exactly how to get the men, the materials, the personnel, and everything that you actually need to make the show. And it's got to be a synergistic relationship between the two. And that's when you get great television, when you have great crack physical production people and harv bennett was that guy harv bennett knew how to produce tv and and he just brought his production acumen what's up Tulula? he brought his production acumen to motion pictures and it worked out great and that's what star trek needs and i think oh what do you need do you want a cookie does Tulula want a cookie you know it's been a long show you want a cookie here come here you want a cookie Come here. Jump up. You coming up? All right. You have a cookie. And you have a cookie. And you have another cookie. And you get a cookie. There you go. You get two cookies. How about that? <clears throat> anyway, I think you're right. I mean, that's that's the real problem. And it's it's tough. It's tough to find that in Hollywood today. Um, and, you know... And, and, and by the way, everybody's fighting for position. It's it's tough. It's brutal. Dan V900 says, I think that as far as people being creative heads, Filoni has proven that he isn't ready so far with The Mandalorian. I was worried about the fifth episode with him writing, and it wasn't good. You know, I have to say, um, I have to say that I agree with you. I'm a fan of what Dave Filoni has done, but clearly uh, has proven he's directed two of these five episodes. I, first of all, again, like I was talking about earlier, I, I really don't understand why write an episode where you go back to Tatooine when you've already done an episode with sand crawlers and Jawas that isn't on Tatooine. I find that to be a, 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 a strange idea. I mean, the, this idea of repeating these Western tropes is one thing, but the fact that we're not getting anything new, we have we knew no, we learned nothing in the way of the the Mandalorian. We don't know what he wants. We don't know anything about Baby Yoda. 
we go back and okay, Amy Sedaris made a a, 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 a guest star turn, but and Ming Na, I mean, what what was she doing? She just went out into the sand. I'm going out into the dune seed to do what? To wait for people to come get me? What was she doing out there? I mean, I was watching this when I was watching this episode. When I was watching this, hey, when I was watching the episode of The Mandalorian, I was perplexed because I really didn't understand why anything was happening. I mean, it, it, it was the most basic of stories. I, it, the animated Clone Wars episodes had far more nuance. And, and far more interesting storytelling going on than anything we saw. Hey, why are you barking? I don't understand. I guess this is time for me to get off the air. But it wasn't good. I was really surprised. I thought the writing and his direction, I mean, he's he's. it's great that he got a shot, but I, I, I really felt that there was nothing in this episode of The Mandalorian, which surprised me. You know, um, hopefully things will get better. Well, everyone, this brings me to a conclusion. You know, it's funny. I don't know if I, I don't know today if I really accomplished what I wanted to accomplish uh, with talking about Star Trek and motion picture. I will leave that up to you. But tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of Star Trek and motion picture, December 7th, 1979 was its release date. And I'm very excited. And if you get a chance, uh, here's your homework, everybody. Your homework is to go find the director's cut of Star Trek The Motion Picture. I know Willow Yang has already done this, but find the director's cut of Star Trek The Motion Picture if you can. Uh, it's only ever been available on DVD. I don't know if somebody has probably put it up on some torrent site, but um, watch it and get back to me. Um, I'd be curious to hear what everybody thinks when they revisit Star Trek The Motion Picture. Look, I'm not saying the Blu-ray, you shouldn't go back and watch the Blu-ray or watch if Star Trek The Motion Picture is streaming somewhere. I don't believe the director's cut is available other than places on YouTube or whatever. But if you can find that, I'd love, I'd love to hear what people think now of Star Trek The Motion Picture. I'm Look, I've heard all the jokes, the slow motion picture. What I'm really interested in is people going back and reassessing the film and uh, telling me what they think about it now. Tallulah, you're not even, you're not even on the, you're on the ground. You're very funny. Look at her. She's, she's a, uh, Look at this dog. Look at her. look at that look at that cute face. Look at those guys. One of them just farted. Terrible. It's usually Gilbert. Um, uh, anyway, I will bring this chat to an end. Rob Observations chat number two hundred ninety. I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel. I want to thank my moderators. I want to thank Lewis Lewis Yu. I want to thank I don't know if Lewis is here actually. I want to thank Jordy Lyons. I want to thank Greg Smith. I want to thank Detective Jim. Jim, get that passport, buddy. Come on, dude. Light a fire under your ass after no time to die. What's up? We're going to London. Whoa! And, of course, the Honorable Mike Bodden, Mayor of Riverdale, Iowa, who uh, I have to say, I, I, I love hearing about. He's barely been around. The website hasn't been updated because, uh, you know, he's been busy being in the mayor of an American city. So uh, if I haven't read your letter, I haven't got to it yet. I have more letters to read, but I'm getting to them slowly but surely. I will not be doing, I hate to say this, I will not be doing a show tomorrow. I apologize. Um, I have to do the live Schmodown event. If you guys don't know what the movie trivia Schmodown is, uh, look it up. I, I I play a character in the movie trivia Schmodown. And I've got my team, the family, and I'm a manager. And there's going to be lots of craziness if you're a Schmodown fan tomorrow. Uh, at the live event. So I will be there. I'll be back Sunday and I won't be missing any more shows in the month of December. So there you go. If you like these chats, please hit like, please hit subscribe. Remember the show is going to get bigger and better and uh, 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 it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to have hot toy cam. I'm going to have hot toy cam. I'm really excited. Uh, so there you go. And with that, I will say, remember every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen, or in my case, listen to Tallulah and her ear-splitting barks. And one more thing, I want to say thank you to 80s Tees, where I got my baby uh, uh, Yoda shirt that I was wearing. This shirt, it says Vince on it, this might be my favorite movie t-shirt of all time. And um, I'll leave it up to you to figure out why that is. When I saw this shirt, I had to have it, uh, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe somebody made that click. And uh, it's very comfortable. I really like this. So yay, 80s tees. 
Thank you for making this shirt that says Vince on it. Somebody will get that. It's not. It, it's a pretty damn deep cut, though. And when I saw that somebody made it, I laughed. And you know what? I keep wearing it. Nobody recognizes it. Maybe some of you will because you're imagination connoisseurs and you know. Anyway, I'll be back on Sunday. I might be uploading a couple of videos. I'll tell you uh, if anybody's interested. I did these XFL cheerleader commercials. I put a few of them up. And I want to make a little video where I can drop all of them together. My old XFL cheerleader commercials that I did in 2000. <laughs> and I I was actually uncovered the videos I made. Well, a couple of them for the Star Trek experience. And I was going to, they're not the in the best shape. Uh, they're pretty low resolution, but they, they were videos that greeted you when you went into the Star Trek experience. And I, I cut them. There's some of the things I worked on, and I, I I probably will be putting those up shortly. And I have more episodes of SF Vortex that I appeared on that I'll be putting up on the Rob Observations channel. So look for that. And remember, next month uh, on Dust, Lucas Kendall's short film Sky Fighter that I edited, that he wrote and directed, will be dropping on the network. And so, you know, I got I got product. I got product coming out. Anyway, I want to thank you all for watching, and uh, if if you imagination connoisseurs wouldn't he be here, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here either. So anyway, thank you for everything. It's great to have you out there. Write letters to thebrunettework.net. Go sign up. Just sign. Just comment on anything. Uh, Ali states new column that I've been delaying. That's been delayed for weeks now is going to drop. She wrote. She wrote. Uh, a very funny column on Raylo from her perspective. The feminine gaze is going to go up again. Uh, I got columns waiting in the wings from her. So anyway, that's coming up. I will see you on Sunday. And as always, have a better day.